اوکے شکرا ان الحمد للہ نحمد وبركاته We have been covering the the topic the rules of nikah the rules of marriage and it so happens that we come upon the chapter the bab the the sexual etiquettes of the the bedroom so we will be covering approximately 30 30 do's and don'ts that are connected to your bedroom and these are frequent questions that are asked by the Muslims so by me covering this topic people don't need to ask me is this halal is this haram is this makro because I am hoping to leave no stone unturned in covering the bedroom etiquettes so that the brothers and sisters who are married or they are thinking about getting married they will know how to behave properly inside the bedroom the first instruction i have in front of me the person taking notes i have approximately 30 instructions the first one is that you should pray to allah taala and beg allah cons- constantly for righteous wives and righteous kids because Allah told you in the Quran in surah 64 verse 14 that sometimes your own wives and your own kids are your own enemies so you should be aware of them now in surah furqan which is surah 25 verse 74 Allah said wal ladina yaqulun rabbana hab lana min azwajina وذريتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما الله تعالى said that the sincere servants of Allah they constantly make the dua ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذريتنا قرة أعين the sincere believers they constantly pray to Allah تعالى and said O oh, O oh Lord bestow on us from our wives and our offspring the comfort of our eyes the joy and comfort of our eyes and make us leaders of the muttaqin so the very first instru- instruction i have in front of me here is that you should constantly make a dua to allah taala and beg allah to bless you with a pious wife because the hasana of the dunya of four things a pious wife a spacious house a good neighbor and a reliable transportation these are the four hasana of the dunya and we constantly make the dua rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab an nar naam surah 25 verse 74 you were instructed by Allah Taala to constantly make the dua and beg Allah for pious wives and pious offspring number 2 you should marry someone if there is chemistry this is the second instruction for the person taking notes the first instruction is that you should make dua and ask Allah to bless you with a pious wife the second instruction is that you should marry someone when you are absolutely sure about the chemistry the chemistry means physical attraction because Allah told you in surah nisa verse 3 fankihu ma taba lakum min nisa marry women who are pleasing to you and whenever the prophet heard of a sahaba who is about to get married he always instructed the sahaba to go and look at his fiance properly to make sure that the chemistry is right um authentic tohi 21 can you bring me the, the hujja where the prophet 
or authentic Torah 10. Bring me Hujjah with the Prophet told his companion to go and look at a woman before he marries the woman. Okay, this is the the ayah, marry, marry woman of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear that you shall not be able to do justly, you cannot deal justly with them, then marry just one. Then only one or slave that you write and possess. Yeah, so the hadith says that the Prophet always instructed his companions to look at the women before they marry them. On the authority of Abu Huraira, I was with the Prophet وسلم, when a man came and told him that he had married a woman of the Ansar. The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, Have you seen her? He said, No. He said, Go and look at her, for there is something in the eyes of the Ansar. So the Ansar is the, some, some of them have a defect in the eyes. So the Prophet commanded his companion to go and look at the woman that he is intending to marry because the Ansars are known for having a defect in the eye. Now, so this is the second instruction that you should look at the person you are going to marry because you are not allowed to marry without chemistry. The th third instruction, when you marry the woman you should place your hand on her forehead and recite a dua. This dua was taught to us by the Rasul Wasallam, because when the Rasul Wasallam married Aisha, he did this. Allahumma inni as'aluka min khayriha wa khair ma jabaltaha alayhi wa a'udhu bika min sharriha wa shar ma jabaltaha alayhi. O oh Allah, I beg of you the goodness that you place within her and the goodness of her and the goodness that you have placed within her and I seek refuge in you I seek refuge in you from the evil of her and the evil that has been created within her now this hadith can be found in Abu Dawud and Ibn Majah so you are supposed to put your hand on the forehead of your wife and recite this dua um, um, did I recite the dua to to fast? Allahumma inni as'aluka min khayriha wa khair ma jabaltaha alay wa a'udhu bika min sharriha wa shar ma jabaltaha alay This is a dua You put your hand on the forehead of the woman and recite this dua The wife should wear makeup She should beautify herself on the wedding night O oh Allah, I ask you for the good in her and the good with which you have created her and I seek refuge in you from the evil in her and the evil with which you have created her Abu Dawud and it is cursed by Abu Dawud and Ibn Majah according to my notes Abu Dawud and Ibn Majah yes the wife should wear makeup she should beautify herself because when Aisha got married she was beautified by Asma bint Yazid ibn Asakan. Maybe you could find this hadith Asma bint Yazid. Okay, this is the name of the female Sahabi who beautified Aisha for her wedding night when she presented her to the Prophet. Her name is Asma bint Yazid ibn Asakan. Asma bint Yazid ibn Asakan. She was the female Sahaba who beautified Aisha for the Prophet. So, a woman who is going on a honeymoon, she should beautify herself with makeup and perfume. For her husband because the first impression is the lasting impression and there is no harm in you wearing stockings for your husband and negligee uh, which is called lingerie there is no harm in you wearing lingerie for your husband perfume stockings because you are going on a honeymoon 
Therefore, you should make an effort. Because when Aisha was presented to Rasul, she was beautified for the Rasul وسلم, The fifth instruction in front of me. But Asma bint Yazid ibn a second. Okay, shukran for finding the hadith. I beautified Aisha for Allah's messenger. Then called, yes. I beautified Aisha for Allah's messenger. Then call him to come to see her and un her unveiled. Okay, shukran. The fifth instruction is that you pray two rakah together. Now, this instruction is from the scholars and it is not from the Prophet. That you and your wife pray two rakah together before you consummate the marriage. The Prophet did not do it. This is just a tradition among the Islamic scholars that when they marry a woman, they pray two rakah together before they consummate. But he, the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, didn't do this. The hikmah behind it: you have a, a beautiful wife on the honeymoon, for you to pray two rakah together. I don't think your man will be on the salah. That's my personal opinion. Your man will will be all about consummating the marriage because you have a beautiful wife. You are on your honeymoon. Your man is all about consummating. However. The scholars they mentioned this and said that you are permitted to do this, to pray two rakah together as a couple. But the Prophet, please be, please be informed that the Prophet did not do it. It's just a tradition among the Muslims, especially the Islamic scholars. Now, before you consummate the marriage, the other instruction is that you should give your wife. something to to eat or to drink because Asma bin Yazid said I beautified Aisha for the Prophet and before the Prophet consummated the marriage the Prophet gave her milk to drink so you should show kindness to your wife before consummating the marriage by giving her something to eat or to drink I think most women like chocolate you could try chocolate now find out what she likes before my experience with women is that women like chocolate but find out from her what she likes or ask her sister ask her mother ask her sister what she likes and give her something to eat or to drink before you consummate on the honeymoon the Prophet gave Aisha milk to drink before the consummation the other instruction is that you should make a dua before consummating Allahumma jalimna ash shaitan wa jannib ash shaitan ma razaktana O Allah prevent us from the shaitan and prevent our offspring that you are about to bestow upon us from the shaitan so the husband is supposed to say bismillah allahumma jalimna ash shaitan wa jannib ash shaitan ma razaktana the other instruction um, this hadith is found in Bukhari the hadith I was quoted to you the prophet said allahumma jalimna ash shaitan wa jannib ash shaitan ma razaktana this hadith can be found in Sahih Bukhari. The other instruction I have in front of me is that you should practice foreplay with your wife because the Prophet said, Do not go to your wives like the animals do. Have foreplay with your wife. The purpose of foreplay is to relax her body and to get her into the mood, to prepare her physically and emotionally for penetration the purpose of the foreplay is to relax her to get her into the mood to prepare her physically and emotionally for penetration make do up before consummating have foreplay okay before you consummate the marriage give your wife something to eat or drink okay very good yes 
Okay, I'm glad you are listing the notes one by one because I have over 30 instructions. Uh, please do not forget to list any because I have over 30 instructions in regards to the bedroom etiquettes in Islam. The, the ninth instruction is that all, all sexual positions are permissible in the bedroom as long as you enter your wife in her private parts as long as you enter your wife in the vagina all sexual positions are permissible so when the Sahabas migrated from Mecca to Medina they found their Muslim brothers in Medina they were influenced by the Jews they had Jewish neighbors and they were influenced by the Jews and the Jews believed that if a man should go to bed with his wife from behind from behind in the vagina the purpose the, the name of this sexual position is called all fours uh, the name of this sexual position is called all fours because the woman is on her two knees and her two hands so they call it all fours the companions in Mecca used to practice this position with their wives but in Medina it was a taboo why? because they believe that the child will be born with a squint eye if the woman is impregnated with this position so a sahaba from Mecca married a girl from Medina and he tried to make love to her with this position which is called all fours and she objected and she didn't agree because she was influenced by the superstition which the, Jew the Jews spread in Medina so because of her behavior in the bedroom Allah revealed Baqarah 223 Nisa'ukum harthun lakum fa'tu harthakum anna shittum Your wives are a piece of land for you to cultivate when, when or how you will So Allah said your wife is a piece of land for you to cultivate Harth Harth means a piece of land to cultivate Baqarah 2 to 3 So cultivate your land in whatever style or fashion you want this ayah tells you that all sexual positions are permissible in the bedroom as long as you enter in the vagina now the scholars they mention some sexual positions that are dislike and that is the acrobatic sexual positions to impose on your wife acrobatic sexual positions it is makru because maybe your wife is fat and she cannot go into these positions unless she is into yoga only the women who do yoga can fit can go into these sexual positions so the scholar said the acrobatic sexual positions these are makru because you are imposing on your wife difficulties so it's better for you to do the normal positions that do not put a burden on your wife the other instruction is the instruction of sodomy is it permissible for a man to sodomize his wife to enter his wife in the anus there is difference of opinion among the scholars but the correct opinion is that sodomy is not allowed this is a stance taken by my university Muhammad ibn Saud because the sheikhs when they gave us the tafsir of the ayah Baqarah 223 they told us that sodomy is not allowed now why is it that there is difference of opinion because of conflicting hadiths in this regard there are conflicting hadiths some support sodomy and some are against sodomy now the Shiites they promote sodomy and the authority of Jabir who said the Jews used to say if a man entered his wife in the vagina but from behind their child would be cross-eyed then Allah revealed the verse your wives are as a tilt 
unto you, so approach your tilt when and how you will. Baqarah 2.2.3. Yes, this is called Asbab and Nizul, causes of revelation. The Prophet said, from the front or the back, as long as it is in the vagina, Bukhari. And Muslim, it is agreed upon. Yes, the Shiites, they promote sodomy. And they use Baqarah 2.2.3 to promote sodomy. They say, Allah said, your wives are a till for you to cultivate. So go to your wife in whatever style and fashion you want. So if I want to practice anal sex with my wife, I didn't do anything wrong. The scholars use the same ayah to refute the Shiites by saying, Allah said, you should cultivate your wife. The cultivation cannot take place with anal sex. The cultivation can only take place with vaginal sex. So we use the same ayah to refute the Shiites. We use the exact same ayah to refute the Shiites because Allah said cultivate your wife and the cultivation can only take place with vaginal sex not anal sex um, the Rasul sallallahu said any man who goes to a soothsayer and believe in the soothsayer or enters his wife in the anus has rejected faith in what came down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. that is one hadith but then there's another hadith where they said Omar <clears throat> Omar entered his wife in the anus and the Prophet didn't say anything when Omar told the Prophet about it now this hadith which is found in Tirmidhi that Omar entered his wife in the anus and he told the Prophet and the Prophet didn't say anything I have to confess that this hadith needs further research to find out if the hadith is da'if Okay, the Prophet said, the one who has intercourse with a menstruating woman or with a woman in her back passage or who goes to a fortune teller has disbelief in what was revealed to Muhammad Okay, this hadith was reported by a tirmidhi and the hadith about Omar was also reported by tirmidhi. Now, why did my university take a stance against anal sex? They took a stance against inner sex, even though they are aware about the hadith of Omar. Hadith conflict with Omar entered his wife in the anus, but we need to research this hadith. Yes, there is no doubt that the hadith about Omar is not a strong hadith. And because the hadith is not strong, you cannot use it as hujjah. So, sodomy, the correct opinion on sodomy is that sodomy is haram. The other instruction I have in front of me, you are allowed to speak with your wife during intercourse on the authority of Ibn Baz. Omar al-Khattab came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, I am destroyed. The Prophet asked, um, just a minute, the Prophet asked, and what has destroyed you, O Omar? Omar said, I turned my mount around last night. An expression which means he has sexual intercourse with his wife, penetrating the vagina, penetrating the vagina while mounting her from the rear. Okay, this is the hadith. That means it didn't have anything to do with anal sex. I'm sorry. The hadith doesn't say anything about anal sex. Therefore, Omar did not do anal sex with his wife. The Prophet gave him no answer and when the revelation came down and the verse was revealed which says your wives are a tilt unto you so approach your tilt I'm sure this hadith is found in Tirmidhi your tilt when you will yes so th this hadith has nothing to do with anal sex because the hadith says Omar entered his wife in the vagina so this hadith has nothing to do with anal sex and because of that my university take a stance against anal sex and they took a stance against it that it is haram now 
Even though the Shiites promote inner sex, one of their top ayatollahs, Imam Khoui, Imam Khoui who died a few years ago, he outlawed anal sex. So not everybody went along with Khomeini and said anal sex is, is permissible. Khoui, one of the top ayatollahs, he outlawed it. So not because Khomeini said it is permissible, not every ayatollah went along with Khomeini and promoted anal sex. So this hadith of Tirmidhi, where Omar, Omar made love to his wife from the back, it has nothing to do with anal sex, because the hadith says Omar entered his wife in the vagina. And this hadith doesn't have anything, it didn't say anything about anal sex. So the opinion that it is haram is the most accurate opinion. And the reason for this is because the anus wasn't created by Allah for pleasure. And the people who indulge in this practice, they have to take inside the bedroom with them a lot of Vaseline. While if they were practicing vaginal sex, there would be no need for Vaseline, for lubricants. They need lubricants in the bedroom because the anus, the anus was not created by Allah for that purpose. And if a Muslim sister complains to her wali about her husband indulging in anal sex, the wali can annul the marriage. The wali of the sister can annul the marriage. The other instruction, you're allowed to speak during intercourse with your wife and what you and your wife say when you speak, that is between you and your wife. You can speak during intercourse and what you say between yourselves, that is between you and your wife. There is a hadith that says to speak during intercourse is haram, but the hadith is fabricated. I repeat, there is a hadith that says it is haram to speak during intercourse, but that hadith is fabricated. In the twelfth instruction, you're allowed to take off your clothing. Now, some people, they do not want to take off their clothing during intercourse with their wives, but according to Sharia law, you are allowed to take off all of your clothing clothing the other instruction I have in front of me and this is the 13th instruction if you are practicing polygamy you are not allowed to go to bed with both wives simultaneously so there is no three sums in Islam or four sums so it is inhumane and it is emotional abuse for you to make love to one wife in front of the other. So those of you who are practicing polygamy and you might be thinking about a threesome, uh, there is no threesomes in Islam and this practice is haram. And the reason why threesomes is haram is because nobody is allowed to look at the private parts of somebody else. The only person who are allowed to look at the private parts of each other is the husband and the wife because Aisha used to have shower with the Rasul Sallallahu and this is why threesomes are haram the other instruction is that if a person is having erectile dysfunction he is allowed to take tablets to gain erection so a person who has erectile dysfunction, he is allowed to take tablets like Viagra or the other well-known tablets to help him in the bedroom. But if you are young and healthy and strong, then Viagra for you is makru because there is no need for you to take it. But if you are old and you have a young wife and you have a problem, to satisfy her her sexual needs if you take Viagra you did not do anything wrong 
The other instruction on the authority of Aisha Anha who said, I used to bath with the Prophet from a single container of water which was placed between us such that our hands collided inside it. He used to raise me such that I would say, leave some for me, leave some for me. She added, we were in a state of Janaba, post-sexual impurity. Bukhari and the Muslim. So you're allowed to shower with your wife. But that instruction will come up in my notes as we go along. The other instruction is that you are not allowed to expose the bedroom secrets of each other. This is the 15th instruction. You are not allowed to expose the bedroom secrets of each other. So even though you go to bed with your wife and she gave you a wonderful time in bed and you are impressed with her performance and the shaitan makes, tempts you to brag about your wife's ability, this is not allowed in Islam. And a woman, you went to bed with your husband and you were impressed with his ability you're not allowed to go and brag to your friends about your husband's ability to satisfy you in the bedroom because this will cause your friends to want to go to bed with your husband your friends will say I would like to join the fun and they want to go to bed with your husband so because of that it is haram for you to expose your bedroom secrets to your friends and colleagues so the Rasul found out that some women some female sahabas were doing it. They used to sit down and talk about sex. And they used to compare their sex life with the sex life of other women to see if they are missing out on anything. The Prophet found out about what they were doing and the Prophet said, maybe some of you women are talking what you do, you are discussing what you do in secret with your husbands in the bedroom. A woman said, Wallahi, O Messenger of Allah, they are doing it. The Prophet said, that is like one shaitan speaking to another shaitan in another hadith. It's like two donkeys having sex in the street and the people watch. So your bedroom secret should remain a secret and a woman has the right to divorce a husband if he is of that type, a man who exposes her bedroom secrets. The other instruction I have in front of me, and this is instruction, okay, Asma bint Yazid narrated that she was once in the presence of the Prophet and there were both men and women sitting. The Prophet then said, perhaps a man might discuss what he does with his wife or perhaps a woman might inform someone what she did with her husband. The people were silent. Then I said, oh yes, oh messenger of Allah, verily both the women and the men, they do that. They discuss their bedroom secrets. Then the Prophet said, do you, do not do that. The Prophet said, do not do that. It is like a male shaitan who meets a female shaitan along the way and has sex with her while the other people look on collected by Ahmed and this hadith is Hassan or Sahih due to supports so this hadith is not Da'if it is Hassan or it is Sahih Sahih means authentic and Hassan means good so this is the hujja that to disclose your bedroom secrets is haram The other instruction I have in front of me concerning oral sex the Quran and the Sunnah keeps quiet about oral sex so it is up to you and it is up to the ijtihad of the ulama the ulama who permits oral sex is the Maliki Madhab and the Hanbali Madhab I do not know what the Hanafis say about it or the Shafis my research didn't uncover anything about them but the Maliki Madhab and the Hanbali Madhab they allow oral sex in the bedroom 
because their view is everything is halal in the bedroom except anal sex. That is the, the view of the Malikis and the Hanbalis. Everything in the bedroom is halal except anal sex. Now the scholar who promotes oral sex was Kurtubi in his book uh, in his tafsir, tafsir Kurtubi. Um, can the admins bring me the hujja of the Kurtubis? Uh, uh, tafsir Kurtubi. Kurtubi is a Maliki scholar who lived in Spain. He was from Spain. And the Malikis also promoted in another book called Ahkam, Ahkam al Quran. But I will not put a burden on you to bring me all of the hujja. One is enough. The basic ruling regarding the wife seeking pleasure of her husband's penis is that of permissibility. However, that which is feared is that this act may lead to possible oral intake of sperm or prostate fluids. The Hanabila, the Hanbalis, have indicated the permissibility of a wife kissing her husband's penis. Also, Asbah from the Malikiya has indicated the permissibility of a man kissing his wife's vagina, uh, as is mentioned in Tafsir Kurtubi, volume 12, page 231. Yes, these are the two madhabs that promote or they agree with oral sex, the Malikis and the Hanbalis. I have to claim ignorance. I don't know what Abu Hanifa said about it or Imam Shafi himself. My research didn't uncover anything from the Shafis or Abu Hanifa madhab. The other instruction I have in front of me is that it is not permissible to, for a woman to swallow the semen of her husband. Even though the sperm is classified pure according to Islamic Sharia, it is not permissible, like your Jews, it is not permissible for a woman to swallow the discharge of her husband and vice versa. It is haram for the man to swallow the discharge of his wife. So both are not permissible. A woman swallowing her husband's semen and a man swallowing his wife discharge. This is not allowed in Islam. The other instruction, which is instruction number 18, you are not allowed to play with the anus of each other in the bedroom because the anus was not created for pleasure. It is haram for you to play with your own anus or to play with the anus of somebody else. I repeat, it is haram for you to play with your own anus or to play with the anus of somebody else that is haram in Islam. It is also haram for people to lick the anus of each other in the bedroom and the people who indulge in these practices they are in the movie industry, the adult movie industry, and they keep pushing the boundaries further and further and further to shock their audience, to capture the attention of their audience. So they keep pushing the, the boundary further and further and further. So the Islamic Sharia is here to put a lid on the situation. No Muslim is allowed to imitate the kuffar because they do not know what is halal and what is haram what is mustahab, what is makru these things are not in their vocabulary therefore the sharia law is here to put a lid on the proliferation of perversion in the society so perversion has become widespread in the society because the kuffar with their media they promote things that are considered to be a taboo so Allah Ta'ala has blessed us with the Sharia, the Islamic Sharia, to put a lid on the situation. Therefore, people will not see a thing which is a taboo and think that it is the norm. When you are in the bedroom with your wife, you are not allowed to take toys in the bedroom like a dildo, a vibrator, and use these things 
and insert these things inside your wife this is totally haram because these things are competing with the male the male member the male the, the manhood of the man the penis of the man so because these things were created by man to compete with what Allah has created you are not allowed to take sex toys in the bedroom and insert these sex toys in your wife like dildos and vibrators and other things because these things were created by men to compete with what Allah has created um, I hope nobody in the room is le is under 18 years old if you are under 18 um, I'm sorry under 16 if you are under 16 years old it's better you don't listen to this dars I made a mistake I should have told the admins to tell the people who are under 16 not to come to the dars because this dars is not for children but those who are under 16 so a man who uh, just a minute a man who is old and he is unable to satisfy his wife sexually even though he is old and he cannot satisfy his wife sexually it is not allowed for him to insert dildos in his wife because sex toys are not allowed because they are used to compete with what Allah has created which is the manhood the penis that Allah has created and you are not allowed to use man-made toys to compete with what Allah Ta'ala has created the other instruction I have in front of me instruction 21 to blindfold your wife which is a sex game is permissible and this permissibility is allowed if the woman trusts the man he has proven to be trustworthy if he has proven to be trustworthy if you blindfold your wife which is a sex game there is no harm in that it is not haram uh, some people they blindfold their wives and put food in the wife's mouth and she has to guess which fruit he is putting in the mouth six different types of fruits and she has to guess which fruit he is inserting in her mouth the other instruction for those people who got carried away and have sex with their wives during menstruation they have to pay an atonement the atonement for having sex with your wife during the menstruation is four and a quarter grams of gold you have to give away four and a quarter grams of gold in charity so you go to the masjid and you drop the equivalent four and a quarter grams of gold in charity I think it's about 50 US dollars um, just a minute I think it's about 200 US dollars sorry how much is four and a quarter grams of gold anybody in here who deals in gold my friend who deals in gold and silver he's not here today it was calculated for me uh, previously four and a quarter grams of gold I think it's 500 US dollars for four and a quarter grams of gold um, could you find out how much is four and a quarter grams of gold this is the atonement the expiation for anyone who went to bed with his wife while she is menstruating if he went to bed with his wife and her menstruation came during the lovemaking and he didn't know until after he finishes he doesn't pay anything because he didn't know but if he knew she was menstruating and still he went to bed with her while she's menstruating he has to give away four and a quarter grams of gold in charity the other instruction I have in front of me is that a woman who was menstruating and then her menstruation stops she is not allowed to go to bed with her husband until she makes ghusl and the evidence for this is Baqarah 222 
So no woman is allowed to go to bed with her husband when her menstruation stops until she performs ghusl. Because of the ayah, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ أَنِ الْمَحِيدِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذَا فَعْتَزِلُوا النِّسَاءِ فِي الْمَحِيدِ وَلَا يَتَقْرَبُوهُنْ حَتَّى يَتْحُرْنْ They ask you, O Muhammad, concerning the menstruating woman, say that menstruation is a harmful thing for a husband to have sexual intercourse with his wife during her menses. Therefore, abstain, keep away from women during menstruation. And go not unto them until they have purified from menses and have taken a bath. So, Bakara 222 is evidence that you have to take a bath, you the woman, you have to take a bath before you are allowed to go to bed with your husband. If you went to bed with your husband before taking a bath, you have done a sin. It is sinful for you to do so. So ghusl is a requirement before you are allowed to go to bed with your husband. If you go to bed with your wife once and you want to go back a second time, both of you have to do istinja, which is to wash your private parts. I repeat, if you go to bed with your wife once, and that same night you want to go back a second time like half an hour later an hour later you are not allowed to go to bed until both you and your wife did a stinger which is to wash your private parts and you should make it is good it is sunnah mu'akkada to make wudu as well but if you make a stinger by itself without wudu you do not do anything haram Okay, the, the next instruction, um, the person taking notes, what, um, what number have we covered, how, how many instructions have we covered? Instruction 24, I, I put it to you that if you went to bed with your wife and you desire to have sex with her a second time, both you and your husband will have to make Istinja. Istinja means to wash your private parts. And if you make istinja, then make wudu, then go back to bed, it is better. But if you make istinja alone without wudu, you do not do anything wrong. However, istinja is necessary if you want to go back to bed with your husband a second time. Yes, I hope. Yeah, that is what I said. I shook on for the notes. Yes. If you went to bed with your wife once in the night and you desire to go back with her a second time the same night, both of you should make istinja. Istinja means to wash your private parts. And if you make istinja and wudu, it's even better to do both things. I had it narrated by Ibn Abbas from the Prophet وسلم, who enters his wife while she is on her period as follows let him give one dinar in charity or one half dinar okay shukran for the the hadith um, can you find the fatwa of the modern day scholars who specify four and a quarter grams of gold in charity shukran for the hadith and please find me the fatawa of a scholar, a modern day scholar who said you have to give away 4.25 grams of gold. Four and a quarter grams of gold in charity if you slept with your wife while she's menstruating. Because this is the fatwa given to me by my sheikhs when we were covering the atonement for those who went to bed with their wives while she was menstruating. That is the atonement. I think it's 500 US dollars for four and a quarter grams of gold. Instruction 25, you are allowed to, to shower together as a couple in a naked state. 
So you and your wife, it is halal to shower as a couple in a naked state. Okay, besides he should expiate for this by giving one dinar of gold or half a dinar of gold in charity. A dinar weight is four and a quarter grams of gold. Shukran authentic to ten for the specific fatwa. Yes, this is what I learned in university. You have to give away four and a quarter grams of gold. And the reason why I asked for the specific fatwa is because you don't know what is dinar or half a dinar. So I asked for the specific fatwa, which is four and a quarter grams of gold, to convince the audience in the room that I did not make up my own thing. That this is what I learned, that you have to pay four and a quarter grams of gold if you went to bed with your wife while she is menstruating. Yes, so you're allowed to shower with your wife in a naked state. Instruction 26, you are allowed to have sex with your wife in the shower as well. So not only are you allowed to shower with your wife in a naked state, both of you naked, you are allowed to have sex with your wife in the shower. Because according to Sharia law, everything is halal until proven haram. The other instruction is your wife is a woman is allowed to masturbate her husband until he ejaculates. A woman is allowed to masturbate her husband until he ejaculates and vice versa a woman a man can masturbate his wife until she ejaculates as long as he uses his left hand without any dildos. He is not allowed to insert any foreign objects in his wife. So if he uses fingers, he did not do haram. If he used a dildo, he did haram. Because dildos are haram. So a woman can masturbate her husband until he ejaculates and vice versa. Providing he, use his left, he has to use his left hand. And he has to avoid using dildos to make his wife, to make his wife ejaculates. He has to do it himself without the use of sex toys. Sex toys are haram because they were created by man. They were made by man to compete with Allah's creation. And the kuffar are so evil, they have made machines. And these machines, they operate with electricity. And these machines have a penis. And women who are single, they buy the machines and take home for the purpose of masturbating. This type of masturbation is haram. I know the humble is a allow masturbation. The humble is allow masturbation. But the humble is didn't allow masturbation with dildos. The humble is allow it for men and women but without sex toys. The other instruction. Uh, the humblers did not allow vibrate vibrators, please. The humblers didn't allow vibrators. So even though the humblers allow masturbation, they didn't allow vibrators. And these things are haram because they are used by people to compete with what Allah Ta'ala has created. They are trying to use vibrators to compete with the penis that Allah Ta'ala has created. So vibrators are haram. During intercourse with your wife, uh, some people are coming to my class very, very late. I wonder why. The people who created vibrators, they create vibrators for feminists. Some women are lesbians, some of them are feminists. These women said, men are dogs. Stay away from men. And they, they make these vibrators and dildos to compete with Allah's creation. 
this is why these things are haram because these women think that they do not need men because the kuffar have made for them these sex toys so they said we don't need men anymore they are feminists and they are lesbians and they believe men are dogs who need men? men are dogs and they use vibrators and dildos to replace men therefore these things are haram whenever you are having sex with your wife you are allowed to practice coitus interruptus coitus interruptus is a form of birth control Um, coitus interruptus, have you spelled the word? Coitus interruptus, interrupt, okay, shukran. Yes, you, you get the gist of it, except that it has two R's. Coitus interruptus to pull out your penis before the sperm touches the body of the woman. This is halal, but you need the permission of your wife because by pulling out you cut her pleasure. If if the woman is a concubine, you don't need her permission. But if it's a a wife that you marry, you can't do coitus interruptus without the permission of your wife because you cut her pleasure as, as sahaba, the sahabas used to do coitus interruptus and the prophet didn't stop them the word for it is pull out or to withdraw to pull out your manhood before the ejaculation you need her permission yes you need the permission of the wife but you don't need the permission of a concubine just the wife The next, a woman who is studying in university and she wants to get married but she has three years left to finish the course or two years, she is allowed to practice birth control. The birth control is halal for women. A woman who is studying in university, for example, and she wants to finish her education and she takes pills. as a form of birth control or any other type of birth control that they have she did not do anything haram because birth control is halal in Islam ok what do you have for me Jabir Jabir may Allah be pleased with him reported we used to practice Azal during the lifetime of the Prophet Allah's Messenger this news of this practice reached Allah's Messenger and he did not forbid us yes so because the Prophet did not forbid them to pull out which is to withdraw coitus interruptus is halal but you need the permission of the wife because you cut her pleasure short birth control pills are halal in Islam so if a woman should practice birth control, she did not do anything haram. Now, the other subject, abortion. Abortion is also halal in Islam. So if a woman is pregnant and she doesn't want to have the baby, she is allowed to abort the baby before six weeks because abortion is halal in Islam and that is humble fiqh. I repeat, this is humble fiqh. So if a person who is of the Maliki Madhab or Abu Nifa tell you you are doing haram, you say to them, I am acting in accordance with my Madhab. So a woman can abort a child if she doesn't want to have the child. Because abortion is halal in Islam. 
Why? Because the angel did not blow the breath into the child until after the third 40 days, 120 days. So you cannot accuse her of killing somebody because the breath was not blown into the child. So abortion is permissible before six weeks and that is humble effect. The morning after tablet is also permissible for a woman to take. So if a woman is pregnant and she is not in the mood of a baby and she takes the morning after tablet, she did not do anything haram because she didn't kill anyone because the breath is not blown into the child until after 120 days. As for pills to grow a woman's breast or pills to grow the manhood of a man, this is also permissible if the wife complains about the size of his manhood. So pills and some of these pills work. I can give you the brand names of those who work. But a pill might work for some people but not others because our genetic built up is different. It all has to do with our biology. Some of us, the pill react to us and it works for us. Others, it didn't work. Pills to grow your manhood or your breast is permissible. If your wife is contented with your manhood, it's better to leave it alone. As for the practice of pinning down your wife, we don't want to say you rape your wife. In Dara Harb, in places like the UK, the USA, if a man rapes his wife, he can go to jail. According to Sharia law, you cannot rape your wife because rape is when you pin down a woman who is not halal for you. But because your wife is halal for you, rape cannot take place between you and your wife. Rape is only when the woman you pin down is haram for you. The evidence is that a man used to work at night and when he came home, he found his wife fasting. He used to pin her down and have sex with her. She complained to the prophet and the prophet took side with the husband and said no woman is allowed to fast without the permission of the husband because she was fasting and he would come home and break her fast because he pins her down and have sex with her. Married women don't have a problem with being pinned down because the greatest fantasy of a woman, listen carefully, the greatest fantasy of a married woman is for her to be pinned down by her husband because it makes her feel wanted and it makes her feel loved. So married women don't have a problem with this. They only have a problem if they hate their husbands. That's only when they have a problem with being pinned down. So according to Sharia law, rape only takes place when you pin down a woman who is haram for you. If you pin down your own wife who is halal for you, it's not rape. But according to the British law, the American law, it is still rape even though your wife is halal for you. Because the Kufar, they have a weird and bizarre concept of rape. We don't agree with the Kufar in regards to anything. Their law is bizarre and weird. Um, did you find the hadith about the Sahaba who used to come home and break his wife fast? And the Prophet said, no woman can fast. The optional fast, the nawafil, without the permission of her husband. Um, please bring me the hadith. It's a very, very famous hadith. According to Sharia law, each time you go to bed with your wife is barakah. This is the last point. How many points have we covered? 33, 34. According to Islamic law, each time you go to bed with your wife, it is barakah <coughs> because of the hadith which is found in hadith 25 of the 40 hadith. Hadith 25 from the 40 hadith of Imam An Nawi. The Prophet said, Wafi budi ahadikum sadaqah. Each time a man goes to bed with his wife, he gets baraka. So the man with a high libido, he gets more baraka than the man with a low libido. <laughs> 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 
Yes, the man with the high libido, he gets more baraka than the man with a low libido, because each time you go to bed with your wife, you get baraka. <coughs> and the man with two wives, is, he gets more baraka than the man with one wife, because the Prophet said, the best men from my ummah are the ones with the most women. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I hope I've covered all the areas sexual etiquettes in the bedroom. I will now pause and take questions. My notes is finished in regards to this regard. <clears throat> and please post your questions and send them to the admins. Okay, you found the hadith. A woman is not allowed to do voluntary fast without husband's permission <clears throat> when he's present. Yes. Because the Sahaba used to come home and pin his wife down and perform his manly duty to have sex with her. She complained and the Prophet took the side of the husband. <clears throat> so you're allowed to pin your wife down. The only time you are not allowed. Um, just a minute, there's, an, there's something in my notes which I forgot to tell you. It is makru to have sex with, during a, a hurricane or a tornado. Um, sorry admins, there's something I forgot to tell you. It is makru to have sex during a storm, a hurricane, a tornado or an earthquake. The scholar said it is makru to have sex at that time. <clears throat> it is makru to have sex during a storm. The person taking notes could write this please. It is makru to have sex during a hurricane, a storm, an earthquake, a tornado. And it is haram to abuse your wife verbally or physically and then go to bed with her. Number 36. It is haram to abuse your wife verbally or physically and then you go to bed with her. And as for pinning your wife down, it should be done playfully, not violently. As for pinning your wife down for sex, it should be done playfully, not violently, and both of you will have to be in the mood for it. It's better when both of you are in the mood to pin her down, it should be done playfully, not violently. And both of you should be in the mood for it. Okay, I will now enter in questions in regards to the topic, sexual etiquettes in Islam. And tomorrow we will continue the rules of marriage because I didn't finish the rules of marriage. This is just the bedroom etiquette. And I need to do the rules of divorce. Not because I'm going to teach you about divorce. That doesn't mean you go on a divorce spree and start to get divorced. I want to teach you the rules of divorce in case you need it in the future. But that doesn't mean you go divorcing. Okay, where are the questions for me? Where are the questions? Rules of Nikah continues tomorrow. Yes, we will. Con My notes isn't finished. My notes about the rules of Nikah isn't finished, and today was just the rules of the bedroom. Okay, have you posted questions? Let me scroll down. The dua. Oh, he put his hand on her forehead and said, "Allahumma." إني أسألك من خيرها وخير ما جبلتها علي وأعوذ بك من شرها وشر ما جبلتها علي. Never, I'll write it for you. Don't worry. I'll write it for you. Having sex intercourse with your wife is a sadaqa. Yes, this is the hadith. Having sex intercourse with your wife is a sadaqa. The companion said, "O Messenger of Allah, is there a reward for him who satisfies his sexual passion among us?" The Prophet said. Tell me if he were to devote it to something forbidden, would it not be a sin on his part? Similarly, if he were to devote it to something lawful, he should have a reward. There are some Muslim women who like to go to the salon to have their pubic hairs removed. It's called the bikini line. If you want your bikini line to be removed, you have to use your husband to do so. 
If you want to shave your pub your pubic hairs, you have to use your husband. If you want to pluck your bikini line, you have to use your husband to do so. So it is Makru to have sex during a tornado, a storm, a hurricane. It is haram to have sex during menstruation. It is haram to abuse your wife verbally and physically, then have sex with her. It is haram to have sex in the daylight hours of Ramadan. If you want to have sex in Ramadan, you have to do so after Maghrib Salah. If you want to have sex in Ramadan, you have to do so after the Adhan of Maghrib, not before Maghrib. If you have sex before Maghrib, you have to free a slave, fast two months, or feed 60 poor people. Free a slave, fast two months, or feed 60 poor people. That is if you go to bed with your wife during Ramadan, the daylight hours. Is it permissible for a man to go to Sudan or Mauritania, for example, and buy a slave if the slave is not Muslim? This is a very important question. Now, this thing of buying slave, uh, some scholars permit it even till today. It's better for you to marry the woman because these slaves are taken on the battlefield and there is no war taking place in Mauritania or the Sudan. So it's better for you to marry this person that you have taken, claiming that she is your slave, to avoid shubha. Shubha means to have to avoid doubts about your character. Um, only one question. Many questions. Is it better for to marry this person in order to avoid doubt in your character? Yes. When, whenever you have doubt about something, you should do something that will stop others from whispering and backbiting you. If you know that there is difference of opinion, marry the woman so that no one can say anything about your character. Because of the hadith. Allah showers his blessings on the man who prevents others from backbiting him. Is it harmful to take the birth control pill? As I told you, different anatomy, different biology. It might be harmful for one woman, but not for the other. The only thing birth control pill does to you is to make you gain weight. There is no other harm. It makes you gain weight for those women who are anorexic. Sometimes they take it to gain weight. That's the only thing it does to you. I don't know of any other harm that birth control does to women. Somebody just PM me to say they came late and they missed the dust and I should repeat it. I repeat it after one year if Allah give me life, not now. I can't repeat it just now, it has to be repeated after one year. Because people don't like when you talk about sex in the room, because people are shy. The Muslims are shy, they don't want to hear about sex. It can be repeated after one year, but not right now. Um, is it wajib to have sex the first night when you married with your husband and are you allowed to say no because you're scared and you want to get to know each other it is not wajib to have sex the same night and whenever you marry a non-virgin you spend three nights with her if you marry a virgin you spend seven nights with her because you need time to get to know 
the virgin. So you need seven nights with the virgin, three nights for the non-virgin. And it is makru to marry when you are menstruating. So whenever you want to get married, you should fix the date on a night when you are not menstruating. Because it is makru to marry when you are menstruating. Um, it was indicated to me by somebody in the medical field that birth control pills can cause clots, blood clots. That's the only risk it has. It can lead to blood clot. Or maybe it causes cysts as well. The doctors in the room can confirm if it causes cysts. A cyst. It is not wise to have relation the first night. A man should spend seven nights with untouched women and three nights with women who have consummated before. If the woman is a virgin, you spend seven nights with her. But if she is a non-virgin, you spend three nights with her. That is the requirement according to the Prophet And it is compulsory on a man to go to bed with his wife once every four days. I repeat, it is compulsory on a man to go to bed with his wife once every four days unless she wants to let him off. But these women in the West, they have such a high libido, they might want you to go to bed with them every day because of the additives in the food and the hormones. That was in the time of the Prophet. But the food that people eat in the West, it makes the women so hyperactive. These sisters might want you to go to bed with them every day. No wonder they don't like polygamy. No wonder they don't like polygamy because they want to go to bed with their husbands every single night. These sisters in the West because of the food that they are eating with so many additives and hormones in the food. Is it wrong for the wife to put her husband's penis in her mouth? This person, weren't you in the dars? I told you that the Hanbalis and the Malikis huh? You're going out? Yeah. You're coming back? Yeah. Okay. The Malikis and the Hanbalis permit oral sex in Islam except that she cannot swallow his semen. Why don't you come to my door sometime so they don't repeat? I don't like repeating myself. The Hanbalis and the Malikis allow oral sex in Islam as long as you don't swallow the semen of your husband and the admins even went as far as to bring the hujja the fatwa from the scholars and the scholar who promotes it or allows it is Kurtubi Kurtubi of the Maliki Madhab and Kurtubi was from Spain Okay, the doctors in the room the doctors in the room said the pills, listen to what the doctors in the room said about contracep contraceptive pills contraceptive pills on the other hand are used to treat recurrent ovarian cyst related to the menstrual cycle so these pills are used to treat ovarian cyst recurrent ovarian cyst Related to the menstrual cycle, this is what the doctors in the room said about birth control tablets. That's one doctor, that was a male doctor. Let me see what the female doctor has to say. Estrogen contains pills, that's the estrogen containing pills. That there are modified ones that contain only progesterone. No contraceptive method is free from side effects. They're just worse than each other. So this is the other verdict of the other doctor in the room. No contraception is f totally free from side effects. Side effects. It's just that some are worse than the other. How do you tell your husband that he is not pleasing you in the bedroom? He is a very proud person, but he does not have good intimacy skills how do I not offend him you have to tell him because you are going to become frustrated and do something drastic 
because you are desperate and desperate people they always resort to desperate things now look at Lorena Bobbitt Lorena Bobbitt cut off her husband's penis she an American woman why because he would jump on her and then he would ejaculate and he didn't care about her ejaculating he cares about satisfying himself but not her he just jump on her ejaculates and then he's gone and he was so selfish he didn't care about her ejaculating so what did she do she cut off his penis because he was selfish he was a selfish lover and no woman likes a selfish lover lover Lorena Bobbitt maybe an admin can bring me the link towards this woman who cut off her husband manhood your husband desperately needs to be told that he is not satisfying you in the bedroom because you are going to become a frustrated woman and you're going to reach a peak of no return in which the pot boils over and you explode and do something drastic either you have an affair because he's not satisfying you in the bedroom and an affair is a bad thing for a woman to do or even a man or you might become frustrated and cut off his penis like Lorena Bobbitt in America yes so he needs counseling and you need to tell him tell him in an indirect way so as not to hurt his feelings the worst thing you can say to a man is to tell him that he was a crap in the bedroom the worst thing you can say to a man that you are crap in the bedroom if a man dumps a woman and then after three months she finds another man and then she sends him a text message SMS and said my new lover is better and better than you that would puncture his male ego he might not be able to have an erection again to get a text message like that it punctures his male ego that's the worst thing you can say to a man my new lover is better and better than you I'm so happy you dumped me I found another man and he's better than you a woman would they like to send text messages like that a woman can be very spiteful they like to send text messages like that and the best way to dump a person is with a text message because maybe he has fatal attraction he might kill you because of fatal attraction he might kill you so the best way to dump a man is by a text message now, some people have fatal attraction so they'll kill you and the male ego doesn't allow for him to be dumped so the best way to dump a man is not face to face is by text message I'm taking 15 questions if a husband refuses to lie with his wife if she wants sex do the angels curse him also if the couple are having problems and the husband isn't fulfilling her desires is a divorce okay you can do divorce but not immediately you do divorce when everything else fails I told you that it is compulsory on a man to have sex with his wife once every four days this law was passed by Omar ibn al-Khattab when he was a caliph and the angels will curse the man if he doesn't fulfill his wife's sexual needs the same way the angel cursed the woman because of Baqarah 228 where Allah said bil ma'ruf." women have the same rights over men as men have over them bil ma'ruf to what is reasonable Ibn Abbas used to dress up for his wives and when disciples asked him why do you dress up for your wife he said because Allah said in Baqarah 228 women have the same rights over men as men have over them when I was on tour of South Africa the woman in Johannesburg said we want a day with Sheikh Faisal a women conference and we don't want no man to be there not even our husbands because we have personal questions to ask him so we had the conference and 250 women came and I told the women that it is compulsory on your wives to it is compulsory on your husbands to go to bed with you once every four days and all I could hear in the auditorium was yes so when I went home my phone was bombarded with the men ringing me and said Sheikh Faisal you you let the genie out of the bottle this is fitna we go for tabliki jama for 40 days and four months when you tell the women at the conference we have to go to bed with them once every four days 
This will pull the rug from underneath the Tabliki Jama. This fatwa will mash up, will destroy the Tabliki Jama. It will mash up the Tabliki Jama. Mash up means to ruin. That's Jamaican English. Mash up means to ruin, and that is Jamaican English. So they said the fatwa will mash up, will destroy the Tabliki Jama. We have to go to bed with our wives once every four days. What about going for 40 days and 4 months? Some men don't like when I tell the women their rights. But I don't want to be a wicked scholar. I have to tell the women their rights. Some men don't like when I tell the sisters their rights. No wonder the sisters said we don't want any men at the conference. Because we have questions to ask. And we don't want to, our husbands to see us asking those questions. The women demanded a woman only conference in Johannesburg, South Africa. In the year 2008, the angels will curse a man who doesn't satisfy his wife's sexual needs. I repeat, the angels will curse a man who didn't satisfy his wife's sexual needs. And the evidence is Baccarat 228. Don't bring me all the ayah, just a piece of the ayah. Baccarat 228, Allah said what? Women have the same rights over you as you have over them to, in regards to that which is reasonable. Can you miss Salah for sex? Yes, if it is Maghrib, you can delay Maghrib for Isha. The Salah you cannot miss for sex is Asr and Fajr. You can delay Dhuhr and pray Dhuhr at Asr time or you can delay Maghrib if, you, if it is Maghrib time and you have the sexual urge you are allowed to delay Maghrib and pray Maghrib at Isha time because if you pray Maghrib, you won't pray a proper Maghrib because you'll be thinking about sex. So you are allowed, allowed to delay your Salah for sex. The Rasul was in Medina and he joined Zuhur with Asr. Then he joined Maghrib with Isha. They said, why did you join O Messenger of Allah and we are not traveling? The Prophet said, Takhfifun ala ummati, to make it easy for my ummah. Takhfifun ala ummati to make it easy for my ummah. Question number eight. I'm taking 15 questions. If a man, uh, if a wife wants more as far as affection, what does that does not include sex? Is the wife show a lack of appreciation? To ask this if the sex between the, the mates are okay. Can the husband say that this should be fine enough that some women don't? The women are from Earth, men are from Mars, we are from two different planets. Women from Earth, men from Mars. Women want affection, but men want sex. That is something you need to know about men. Women want love and affection men want sex so a man is allowed some men they have no emotions attached to the sex women become emotionally attached because of the sex that's why women get hurt all the time the man is having fun he is not emotionally attached to what he's doing men are from mars women are from earth we are two different people women want love and affection men want sex and because of that, women get hurt all the time. They think because the man is having sex with them, the man loves them. That's not the case. The reason why the man is having sex with you is because it's better for him than to masturbate. That's why he's having sex with you. That doesn't mean he's emotionally attached to the woman. That's why women get hurt all the time because they think that the man, his heart is in the relationship the way her heart is in the relationship. That's not the case. Men are from Mars, women are from Earth. We are from two different planets. Women want love and affection, men want sex. If the man is sincere and he's honest, then he wants love and affection as well. If the man is a player, if he's a player, he doesn't want love and affection, he only wants sex because he's a player. He's a Romeo. But if the man is sincere, he wants love and affection as well. And when there is a breakup, the break the breakup 
it destroys him emotionally just like the woman because he was sincere and he wants a stable relationship if the man is a Romeo and a player he's not interested in love and affection he just wants sex and when a person is promiscuous promiscuity destroys you psychologically it's better for you not to be promiscuous because when you are promiscuous you can't maintain a stable relationship you keep moving on from one woman to the next why because of your promiscuity some reverts because they were promiscuous in Jahiliya when they come to Islam they said I want to be a Shia a white man in Belmarsh told me in prison I'm Sunni but when I leave prison I'm going to be a Shia because the Shiite interpretation of the Sharia is exciting I can marry a girl for one hour I'm allowed to marry a different girl every night I can marry a different girl for one hour so the Shiite fic I find very very exciting so he told me to my face when I leave prison I'm going to be a Shia because I can marry a different girl every night for just one hour <laughs> subhanallah zawaj muta so promiscuity destroys a man emotionally and psychologically yeah. promiscuity destroys a man emotionally and psychologically and these men who are promiscuous they can't maintain a stable relationship they keep moving on moving on they become old and they live on their own and they die on their own they end up as a lonely old man a lonely old man with no wife sometimes broke if you have no money you have no wife no money no honey which woman is going to stay with you with no money no money no honey that's the law of nature honey means the woman no money no honey my wife had abnormal cells removed from her cervix a year ago she has stopped having sex with me since I don't have money to practice polygamy should I just consider it as a test from a law and be patient please advise Sheikh um, your wife has to go back to bed with you because of the hadith whenever a woman call whenever a man call his wife to bed and she refuses all the angels in heaven curse that woman whenever a man calls his wife to bed and she refuses to go to bed all the angels in heaven curse that woman so your wife needs to fear Allah and fulfill your sexual needs if she continues to disobey you have to divorce her and move on and the wife needs counseling she needs counseling she's afraid of sex she thinks sex will give her pre-cancer cells again but it's not true the woman is afraid to have sex because she thinks sex is going to cause the kid to come back if the man is circumcised she shouldn't catch cancer again she's afraid of sex because she thinks the sex is going to cause the cancer to come back that's why she's afraid to have sex but that's not the case she should put her tawakkul in Allah and obey her husband and go to bed with her husband yes she needs counseling this woman desperately needs counseling she's afraid of sex because she thinks the cancer is going to come back but that's not the case if your husband is circumcised the cancer will not come back yeah the prophet said if a man call his wife to bed and she refuses all the angels in heaven curse that woman curses her until she obeys her husband until Fajr um, I'm taking 15 questions 9 10 11 12 13 14. or six more questions the reason why I said 15 questions because the admin said a lot of questions if there are no questions, we'll close the halka. Question number 10. So is it okay for the woman to make the first move and at what 
age can a parent teach her children about these subjects? Did you know that in the Asian community, the parents don't teach their kids about sex? Asian parents have issues. Asian kids learn about sex from the playground at school. Every Asian child, they learn about sex from magazines and the playground at school because their parents will never sit and talk to them about sex. I don't know what issues they have. I had a, I had a Pakistani stepdaughter, Kashmiri. As soon as she reached age 12, I tell her the importance of virginity. If you are not a virgin on your wedding night, you disgrace your father. As soon as she reached 12, I tell her the importance of virginity. If you are not a virgin on your wedding night, you disgrace your father. She was only 12, a, a Kashmiri stepdaughter, very, very beautiful. Age 12 is a good age to tell your kids about these issues. A woman can make the first move, yes. Men don't mind the woman making the first move. Men, they like a chef in the kitchen and a tigress in the bedroom. That's what men want. They want a saint when she goes out the door. A saint in her hijab or niqab. A chef in the, in the kitchen. And they want a tigress in the bedroom. If your wife has a combination of all three things, your bread is butter on both sides. A chef in the kitchen and a tigress in the bedroom. And a saint when she goes out of the house. If your wife is like this, your bread is buttered on both sides. A woman can make the first move, yes, it is not haram, and a woman should not be shy with her husband. A good woman is a woman who is not shy with her husband. A good woman is a woman who is a tigress in the bedroom. That's a good woman. And the reason why she can make the first move is because Allah said in Baqarah 2 to 8, women have the same rights over you as you have over them. If women are allowed to propose to men, that means they are allowed to make the first move, to, in to initiate lovemaking. I'm taking 15 questions, no more than that, because Maghrib is knocking on my door. Okay, we have five more questions, could you please ask? Some ulama say that in the Western countries, Sunan Abu Dawood, not Abu And some ulama say that in the Western countries, you can sleep with the non-Muslim women as they are slave girls. Please explain. Uh, these ulama, they are misguided. These ulama, they are misguided. I'm not going to use a harsher word for them. They are misguided and the fatwa they pass goes against the Quran. A slave girl is the captive that you, that were taken from the battlefield captives of war that's why they are called mulk yameen right hand possessed Allah said in the Quran you are not allowed to take captives until you subdue the land surah 8 verse 67 it is not right to take captives until you subdue the land surah 8 verse 67 so you are not allowed to take right and possess in the UK, in Europe and America because these women, they will cry rape and then you get 12 years imprisonment. This is what I saw when I was in Belmarsh. A black man took a white girl as his concubine. She cried rape. He was from Zimbabwe. She cried rape and he got 12 years in London when I was there. So you are not allowed to take captives until you subdue the land. The judicial system, the court system has to be Islamic, then you can take captives. But if you take captives when you did not subdue the land, you went against the Quran. So these scholars, they are misguided. Is it wrong to not want to go to bed with you, the husband if he hurts the wife's feelings? It's not wrong because it is your right your husband is not allowed to abuse you verbally and physically and then go to bed with you. I repeat, it is haram for your husband to abuse you 
verbally or physically and then go to bed with you. He should call you to bed when both of you are in a pleasant mood. Not that he calls you names, he abuses you. That's not the case. And love making is best when both of you are in the mood for it. And to put your wife in the mood for it means you are not allowed to abuse her verbally or physically. And then you call her to bed. So it's not wrong if your husband hurts your feelings. You didn't go to bed with him at that time when he hurts your feelings. Because it's not permissible for him to abuse you verbally or physically and then he goes to bed with you. Question number 13. My husband and I have a lot of children and we often have trouble finding time for intimacy. Is it haram that we may go without for more than four days at a time? Or why don't you go, why don't you have intimacy when you the kids are sleeping. Drink Red Bull and stay up to make love. Why don't you drink coffee or Red Bull and stay up and make love when the kids are sleeping? That's what people do when they have kids. They put the kids to bed and make love when the kids are sleeping. You can go more than four days without making love if the both of you agree to this. If the husband agrees and the wife agrees, you would not do anything wrong because it's a mutual agreement. But for you to go four days without making love and the wife wants it or the husband wants it, then it is not permissible. But if there is a mutual agreement between the wife and husband that we will go four days without making love, you would not do anything haram. But if one of the parties wants it, the wife or the husband, you have to give it because according to Islamic Sharia, it is compulsory on a man to go to bed with his wife once every four days. Who passed this fatwa? Omar ibn al-Khattab. That is the caliph who passed this law when he was the caliph and the prophet said, وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةُ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِينَ Follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guarded caliphs. Can a husband have sex with his wife without her consent? Please clarify what pinning down means. Yes, a sahaba used to do that. He used to come home and find his wife fasting. Not Ramadan, just the ordinary fast. Pinning down means to, to hold her down and have sex with her. A woman don't mind this. They find it exciting. It's a part and parcel of the marriage. You can pin your wife down and have sex with her. It's not rape because rape is only when the wife, the woman is haram for you. Rape, according to Sharia law, rape takes place when the woman is haram for you. But if the woman is halal for you and you pin her down and perform your manly duty, you do not do anything haram. Because a sahaba used to do it and the prophet did not stop him. Likewise, Sahabas used to do withdraw, pull out, and the Prophet didn't stop them. Sahabas used to make love to their wives on all four. All four means from the back, but in the vagina, and the Prophet didn't stop them. As for the hadith about Omar making love to his wife from the back, the hadith specify Omar entered his wife in the vagina, not in her anus. And this hadith is found in at tirmidhi I am the one who asked the question about my wife not having sex with me. She is telling me that it is very painful when she is having sex. That the reason, Sheikh, I don't want divorce because of my lovely daughter I have with my wife. I am really suffering. Okay, if you don't want divorce, you should try polygamy. This is the other option. And you need to do foreplay because I told you in the lecture foreplay is sunnah mu'akkada and the prophet said don't go to your wives like the animals do have foreplay with your wives the purpose of foreplay is to make the woman feel relaxed and to prepare her body emotionally and physically to prepare her emotionally and physically for penetration so a foreplay is sunnah mu'akkada 
a strongly recommended sunnah. So if you do foreplay, the pain will go away. Uh, you need to perfect your love making skills. You need to polish your love making skills so that it, so that she doesn't feel any pain anymore. Use a lot of foreplay and then the pain will go away. If the pain is still there and she doesn't want to go to bed with you, you need to do polygamy. Uh, maybe she's having pain due to medical reasons. Some disease in women cause pain during sex. The doctors in the room are saying some disease in women cause pain during sex. Maybe she's having pain due to medical reasons. The doctors in the room are suggesting you go to the doctor with your wife go to the doctor with your wife and see what the problem is because the doctors in the room say they say that some diseases that are found in women cause pain during sex so this woman needs medical attention it seems I was told also that cervical cancer caused pain during sex and if she was raped as a child if she was raped as a child it caused pain and cervical cancer caused pain for women during sex um, uh, 16 questions please last one you mean is there another question we had a lot of questions lost count um i only take 15 where is it did i answer all the questions okay i would like to close the halka but let me thank those who took the notes and bring the chronic hujja one more question okay bring it quickly maghrib is knocking on my door the question did you list the question as a number question hadith about the angels cursing a woman if she does not have her rights if she does if she if she does not give her his rights if she does not give his rights does that also apply to the husband if wife asks for her rights but the husband makes excuses like he cannot be bothered and carries on like that not giving his wife rights for several weeks and what can the wife do in such a situation excluding divorce um, according to Sharia law it is compulsory on you to work and maintain your wife financially and to provide her with her sexual needs if you did not work and maintain your wife financially you have lost your your conjugal rights your sexual rights and if your wife didn't obey you she has lost her financial rights listen carefully what the Sharia says if you didn't work and maintain your wife financially you have lost all your sexual rights your conjugal rights and if your wife didn't obey you she has lost her financial rights therefore it goes around and comes around that is Sharia law you said excluding divorce because you don't want divorce Allah said in Surah Nisa you need to do arbitration Allah told you in Surah Nisa verse 35 whenever you have a crisis in the marriage and you want to save the marriage in this case you want to save the marriage because you said you don't want a divorce Allah said, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقْ بَيْنَهُمَا فَبْعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ يُرِدَ إِسْلَحَا Surah 4 verse 35 If you have a crisis in the marriage and you want to save the marriage, send a judge from his side and a judge from her side. So arbitration is the only solution for this crisis that you have encountered in your marriage.
Um, I think I have answered all 15 questions. I would like to thank Authentic Tohi 21 for the notes. I'd like to thank Authentic Tohi 10 for the Quranic Hujja and she brought had or he or she brought hadith as well hadith hujja i'd like to thank 80 12 and 16 for the question and answer session i'd like to thank 80 12 and 80 16 for conducting the question and answer session and i'd like to thank authentic toy 21 for the notes and Authentic Toy 10 for the Quranic Hujjah and the Hadith Hujjah. That is our topic, sexual etiquettes in the bedroom. I will continue the rules of marriage tomorrow. Let's hope I can finish my notes tomorrow. These notes are 20 years old. Subhanallah, from university days. I, I recorded these notes from the Sheikh's 1990. I graduated 1992. So these notes are 20 years old. Subhanallah. Okay, shukran subhanak alhumma wa bihamdik nashan la ilaha ilanta nastakfuruka na tubi laik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to this another of our sittings. And we are hoping that this will be the last segment of the topic, the rules of marriage. And uh, I might have to make suggestions to split the rules of marriage into three different titles so that it doesn't look monotonous. And please send out invites to your friends because some people said they got stuck outside the room and they can't get in. Uh, please send out invites to your friends. Somebody just told me they got stuck outside the room and they can't get in and you, you need to show the room you are in. Those of you who are inside the room you need to show the room you are in like I told you to do many times before you need to go to I think actions you go to action change status actions change status then show the room you are in so people can click on you and get into the, the room we are hoping that this will be the last segment of the topic, uh, the, the rules of marriage. So, inshallah, without any further delay, we will continue the topic. The next chapter that I have in front of you is the rights of the wife over the husband uh, the person taking notes the next chapter is the rights of the wife over the husband the first right right is food food is the first secondly clothing food clothing shelter and the fourth is to take her to the doctor so he has to pay the doctor's the doctor's fee the bill if she gets a prescription it's on him to buy the medicine so doctor is the fourth and the evidence for this is the ayah men are the maintainers and the providers the protectors of women so you have to maintain and provide for the woman. Surah Nisa verse 34. Surah 4 verse 34. The other rights of the wife is kindness. The other rights is kindness. That is number 5. So Allah told you, Allah has commanded you in 
Surah Nisa verse 19 bil ma'ruf. Live together with your wife in kindness Okay, men are protectors and maintainers of women Okay, shukran Men are the maintainers and protectors of women So this is the hujja used by the scholars to say You have to provide for her food, clothes and shelter And to take her to the doctor whenever she becomes sick All of that is financial maintenance the fifth right of the wife is kindness because Allah Ta'ala said وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ live together with your wife with ma'roof ma'roof means kindness and with dignity and nobility and to live with her with honor so when you live with your wife with ma'roof it means that your neighbors shouldn't hear your voice that's what it means you, you are supposed to live with your wife with such kindness and, and loving in a civilized manner your neighbors should not hear your voice you're not allowed to live like the animals in the Amazon jungle the animals in the African jungle you and your wife should, be, should live so loving the neighbors don't hear your voice that is a proper Muslim that is the real Muslim because Allah said live together with your wife with honor and with kindness the fifth the, the sixth right um, um, the, um, admins bring me the hadith the best of you are those who treat your wives the best uh, that is the other evidence خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِنِسَائِهِمْ The best of you are those who are the kindest to your wives. أَكْمَلْ مُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُ خُلُقَ وَخِيَارُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِنِسَائِهِمْ The best of you are those who treat your wives the best. Okay, you can find the hadith. Okay, this is the other hadith I wanted to bring. The woman was created from the rib. Okay, shukran. The believers who show the most perfect faith are those who have the best character and the best of you are those who are best to their wives. Okay, shukran for that hadith. Please bring me the hadith. The Prophet said, Be kind and gentle towards women because they were created from the rib. The uppermost rib which is crooked and if you try to straighten her out you will break her and to break a woman is divorce okay sure can yeah, this is the hadith I don't need any more hadith yes so this is the evidence used by the scholars to say that it is compulsory on you to live with your wife with kindness because the Rasul said Ishtosu bin Nisa khairan. be kind and gentle towards women because they were created from a rib the most crooked rib which is the uppermost rib and if you try to straighten her out you will break her and to break her means divorce so I urge you to take care of women and it will break and if you leave it it will remain crooked if you leave it it shall remain crooked if you try to straighten her out you will break her and to break her means to divorce her so I urge you to take care of women to be kind and gentle towards women now this hadith can be found in Bukhari volume 4 and the number is 548 so what are the other rights of the wife over the husband we have mentioned five rights and the fifth one is kindness and we have brought Evidence from Quran and Sunnah to prove that you should be kind to your wife, Surah Nisa, verse 19, and the hadiths of Bukhari that we have quoted. Number six, you are not allowed to abuse her verbally or physically and then go to bed with her. 
It is haram to abuse your wife verbally or physically and then go to bed with her immediately after. And the evidence for this is Surah Nisa verse 19 where the Allah said, bil maruf, Be kind and gentle towards women. Not allowed to abuse her verbally or physically and then go to bed with her immediately after. And the evidence for this is Surah Nisa verse 19 bil maruf live together with your wife with honor. Right, you are not allowed to expose her bedroom secrets. That's the seventh right, the eighth right. It is compulsory on you to be jealous over her. This, the eighth right, it is compulsory on you to be jealous over her because of the hadith of the Prophet where the Prophet said the person who is not jealous over his wife, the day youth, will never go to paradise. Abdullah ibn Omar reported that the Prophet said three people will not enter paradise and Allah will not look to them on the day of judgment. The one who is disobedient to his parents, the woman who imitates men and the third is the day youth the word the youth means a man who is not jealous. In Urdu we say Bihayrat. A man who is Bihayrat. A man who has no jealousy over his wife. So this is the the eight right your wife has over you. You have to be jealous over her. The ninth right is that you have to go to bed with her once every four days. And this fatwa was passed by Omar ibn al-Khattab. And the evidence to prove that you should go to bed with your wife is Baqarah 222 that when she makes ghusl from her menstruation, you should go to bed with her immediately afterwards. Baqarah 222, Allah said, when your wife makes ghusl from her menstruation, you should go to bed with her immediately afterwards. And it is haram for you to go to bed with her before she makes a ghusl when the menstruation stops. The, the tenth right is that you are not allowed to cut her off from her family. Uh, where is the ayah? You are taking too long to bring the ayah. Baqarah 222. Allah said when the woman takes a ghusl from her menstruation, you should go to bed with her. Okay, and when they have purified themselves, then go in unto them as Allah has ordained to you go in unto them in the manner as long as it is in their vagina the, the person who translated the Quran was very specific yes this is the ayah that as soon as she takes she takes a bath from menstruation you should go to bed with her it is her right and you have to go to bed with her once every four days the the ninth right the tenth right, you are not allowed to cut her off from her family unless they are antagonistic towards Islam because of the hadith the one who breaks from the ties will never go to the paradise. The one who breaks off from the ties will never go to the paradise. So this is the, the evidence to prove that you cannot break your wife off from her family. You are oppressing her when you break her off from her family. The only time you can break her off from her family is if the family is antagonistic towards Islam. But as long as her family did not show any antagonism towards Islam, it is haram for you to break her off from her family. And the evidence for this is Surah 60 verse 8. Surah 60 verse 8 was revealed for kafirs. Allah said, the kuffar who didn't fight you for the deen, Allah didn't stop you from associating with them to show them kindness and justice. This ayah was revealed not for Muslims, for kuffar. When, when, when did the ayah come down? Why did Allah reveal the ayah? Because Asma had a kafir mother and she came to visit Asma and she brought gifts. And Asma didn't allow her mother in the home. And Allah did not like how Asma treated her mother. So Allah revealed this ayah. 
لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين الله didn't prevent you from those kuffar who didn't fight you for the sake of your deen that you should deal justly with them and with kindness so if your wife has a kafir mother a kafir father and they did not attack the deen with their tongue they didn't pass remarks against the deen and they did not show any antagonism towards the deen then you are not allowed to break her off from her family if you do that you are oppressing her however if her family are staunch Christians who are trying to make her apostate from Islam then you can break her off from her family why because they are staunch Christians they are evangelical Christians who are trying to break her off from Islam and they are trying to make her apostate from her deen they want her to lose her faith the eleventh right of the wife over the husband is that you should protect her honor you should protect her physically spiritually morally you should protect her in every way you should protect her honor and the evidence you should protect her in every way physically and morally ethically you should protect her in every possible way because of the ayah surah 4 verse 34 arrijal qawwa muna ala nisa men are the maintainers and protectors of women men are the maintainers and protectors of women surah 4 verse 34 We now go to the next chapter. What are the rights of the husband over the wife? We have exhausted the rights of the wife. We will now go to the next chapter. What are the rights of the husband over the wife? The first right is obedience. Um, complete obedience unless he tells you to do something haram unless he tells you to do haram because there is no obedience to the creation when you are disobeying the creator if your husband didn't tell you to do haram then you should obey him if he tells you to do haram like to smuggle drugs from one country to the next from one state to the next state he wants you to smuggle drugs from New York to Washington DC and you refuse to obey him you didn't do wrong because to double in drugs is haram the second right you are not allowed to lend out his belongings behind his back without his permission it is haram to lend out his belongings behind his back without his permission and the third so if your husband is on hedge and somebody wants to borrow his car if he is contactable then you can lend the car with his permission if your husband is not contactable you are not allowed to lend out his belongings without his permission number three you are not allowed to have friends who he dislikes and bring them to the home without his permission you are not allowed to keep friends who he dislikes or bring them to the home without his permission Number three, you are not allowed to have friends who he dislikes. You cannot associate with people he dislikes. And you are not allowed to bring them to the home without his permission. You cannot have friends to the home, not allowed to keep friends he dislikes or bring home without his permission. Number four, you are not allowed to leave the home without the permission of your husband. However, if your husband is not contactable, you are allowed to leave the house without his permission for your needs. You need to go to the supermarket to do your weekly shopping. So even though he's not contactable, you are allowed to leave the house because it's a necessity and you need to go and do your weekly shopping. 
you can't stay in the house and starve to death you have to go and do your weekly shopping so that is permissible because it's a necessity but if your husband is contactable you need to seek his permission before you leave the house number five you are not allowed to refuse his call to bed because of the hadith whenever a man calls his wife to bed and she refuses all the angels in heaven curse the woman until the break of dawn could you bring me the hadith uh, admins yes narrated Abu Huraira Allah the Prophet said if a man if a husband call his wife to bed to have sexual relation and she refuses and calls him to sleep in anger the angels will curse her till morning so a woman who practices this hadith she doesn't refuse her husband call that is a good wife because she she pays close attention to this hadith and she fears the curse of the angels then that is a good wife a woman who pours scorn on the hadith and doesn't care that is a bad wife and you are supposed to divorce her because the man who has a disobedient wife and did not divorce her his salah is not accepted the man with a disobedient wife and did not divorce her his salah is not accepted the sixth right and this is the madhab of Abu Anifa Malik and Shafi the sixth right is that the, hus- the wife should do khidmat for the husband khidmat means to serve the husband so she should pro- prepare his food his clothing and keep his house clean all of that is called khidmat she should serve her husband the humble madhab says it's not compulsory on a woman to do khidmat to the husband all which is compulsory on her is to have sex and nothing else wife should serve khidmat her husband cook clean yes to cook clean to prepare his laundry etc this is the mother of Abu Nifa Imam Malik and Imam Shafi Ahmed ibn Hanbal said I beg to differ it's not compulsory on a wife to do these things the only thing which is compulsory on her is to have sex and nothing else the scholars who say that she should do khidmah they bring the hadith of Fatima the Fatima asks the Prophet for a housemaid because she became tired from doing khidmah for her house for Ali and the Prophet refused her the housemaid and gave her the tasbih go home and recite Subhanallah 33 times Alhamdulillah 33 times Allahu Akbar 34 times it is called the Tasbih of Fatima so the Prophet did not give her any housemaid all he gave her was the Tasbih and told her to go home so the scholars they use this hadith as hujja that a woman should do khidmat for her husband okay the Prophet said surely this is better for you than what you wanted she replied I am pleased with Allah and his messenger she was always uh, she was always satisfied with whatever Allah wished for her um, do you have any takhreej for the hadith I want to know it's in Bukhari Muslim Abu Dawr Tamidi Nisai Ibn Majah um, can you find the hadith with takhreej Okay, Shukran Bukhari, and the, the book is 53 and the number is 344. Okay, Shukran. And the person who is compiling the notes, when you quote the hadith of Fatima, please bring me the takhrij in the notes. The more takhrij, the better the notes, because then it gives the notes credibility. And when we were studying in Saudi Arabia, if we should quote hadith without takhrij the shaykhs would throw it back in our face and they wouldn't accept it they are very very particular and strict about these things when you write your dissertation or a thesis you have to bring takhrij it appears as if the jamhur are accurate 
that the wife should do khidmat for the husband if he provides for her food, clothing and shelter. So if the husband maintains the wife financially, then he, she should do khidmat for the husband. It appears as if the jamhur is correct. Jamhur means the majority because they were able to bring hadith to back up their, their stance. Even though I myself, uh, I, f I follow the Hanbali Madhab, you are not allowed to practice in regards to Madhab. Asabiya is clannishness and rigidity in school of thought. You have to speak the truth where the truth is. It appears as if Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik and Imam Shafi, their opinion is stronger because of the hadith they rely upon that Fatima used to do khidmat for Ali. And when she came to the Prophet and asked for a housemaid, the Prophet gave her tasbih, go home and recite Subhanallah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, Allahu Akbar 34 times, that is better for you than a housemaid. And she said, I am pleased with Allah and His Messenger. And she went home and continued to do khidmat for Ali. In Saudi Arabia, we are prevalent. The, the Saudi girls, when they get married, they have housemaids. Their husbands provide them with housemaid to clean the house and to do the laundry. And some, some of the housemaids, they even cook. Because when I was living in Saudi Arabia, many, many Saudis, they opened their doors to me. They gave, they gave me my own room to stay in. And then you'll have a housemaid bang on my door and leave a tray outside my door with, with, with breakfast. The housemaid would bang on the door and leave my tray outside the door with breakfast. And they bang on the door and leave the tray for lunch. So all the Saudis I stayed in their homes, they have housemaids. Their wives don't wash, cook and clean and do these things. How can a Saudi girl who's coming from a rich home where she had two maids, three maids, now she's married, she has to do housework. That's not how things go in Saudi Arabia. The, the husband provides housemaid for these wealthy Saudi girls. They don't do laundry. They don't clean houses, vacuum the house and these things. They have, some of them have two maids and the richer you are, the more maids you have. So this is what I experienced when I lived in the homes of Saudis. They all have housemaids doing the work for them. And their wives, they beautify themselves for their husbands and they do nothing else. Some of them they study, so they will study. They have university work to do, but not housework. These girls are humbly girls. And the humbly mother says, it's not compulsory on a woman to do housework. The only thing compulsory on a woman is to have sex, nothing else. So the Saudis, they practice this fatwa to the letter because they are humblest. So all these Saudis, the majority of them, maybe 90%, they have housemaids doing their work for them. Their wives beautify themselves for their husbands and they don't do anything else. The maid, the maid is doing the work. So you have two madhabs in regards to a woman doing housemaid. The correct opinion is that of the Jamhur, that a woman should do khidmat for her husband because of the hadith of Fatima that the admins have brought to you on the screen. The seventh right of the husband is that the wife should be grateful to him. And she is not allowed to be ungrateful to him. Because of the hadith, when I went to Isra al Miraj, the majority of people in the hellfire were women. And when Aisha said, Why? Why does the case? The Prophet said, These women, they were ungrateful towards their husbands. The Prophet said, When I was shown the hellfire, and the majority of the dwellers were women who were ungrateful. It was asked, Do they disbelieve in Allah? He replied, they are ungrateful to their husbands and are ungrateful for the favors and the good. Narrated Ibn Abbas, I am sure this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. 
Yes, so the seventh right is that you should be grateful to your husband and the eighth right you are not allowed to fast nafl, the optional fast Bukhari volume 1 page is that page 28 or number 28 never mind is that number or is it page when I said 28 is that 28 number 28 or I think it's number 28 the, the eighth right is that you are not allowed to fast you are not allowed to fast Volume 1, number 28. Okay, Shukran. You are not allowed to fast the optional fast without the permission of your husband. So the Prophet said, No woman is allowed to fast without. No, the Prophet said, No woman is allowed to fast the optional fast without the permission of her husband. A Sahaba used to come home and break his wife fast by pinning, pinning her down. And women like to be pinned down by their husbands if she loves her husband and when the Prophet found out the Prophet said he pinned her down and performed his manly duty the Prophet told the woman no woman is allowed to fast and uh, bring me the hadith please no woman is allowed to fast optional fast without the permission of her husband and the ninth right of the the man is that when he dies you should mourn his death for four months and ten days so when he's dead you you mourn his death for four months and ten days and you're not allowed to accept any proposal until your eight death is finished and the eight death is how is how long four months and ten days these are the nine rights of the husband over the wife the next chapter is the chapter of the walima The walima means the wedding feast. Uh, next chapter, please. Um, you didn't find the hadith. No woman is allowed to fast, optional fast, without the permission of her husband. The next chapter, the walima. The walima of the the nikah is the wedding feast and it is sunnah mu'akkada um, can you hear me am I on mic um, am I, can you hear me okay shukran shukran what is the hukum for the walima the walima is sunnah mu'akkada nothing was on the screen that's why I thought I was not being heard the walima is sunnah mu'akkada it is not fard like Dawud al-Zahiri believes Dawud al-Zahiri claims it is fard to have a wedding feast but the Jamhur Abu Nifa Imam Malik Imam Shafi and Ahmed Ibn Hanbal said that it is Sunnah Mu'akkada a strongly emphasized Sunnah because the Prophet said to Abdurrahman bin Auf Awlim Walaw Bishat have a walima even if it's with one sheep Olim walaw bishat. Whenever you are narrated Ibn Sa'd that the, from his father, from his grandfather, the Prophet said, "Give a walima wedding, even if it is one sheep." Okay, shukran. Bukhari, book thirty-four, number two sixty-four. This was a commandment to Abdurrahman bin Auf: Have a walima even if it's one sheep. The hukum for the walima is sunnah mu'akkada Dawud al-Zahiri claims it is fard But the correct opinion is that it is sunnah mu'akkada Whenever you are invited to the walima You should go because of the hadith The worst food is the food of the walima In which the rich people were invited And the poor people were left out The worst food is the f that of the wedding banquet walima to which the rich are invited whilst the poor are not invited and he who refuses an invitation to a walima disobeys Allah and his Rasul 
This hadith can be found in Bukhari number 4882. Yes, so the wedding invitation. Whenever you are given an invitation to the walima of your Muslim brother or your Muslim sister, you should attend because of the hadith. If you did not attend, you would disobey Allah and His Rasul. The scholars of Islam say, even though it is far to go to the walima, sometimes you are allowed to excuse yourself. If there will be music and alcohol and the dancing, men and women dancing, if that's the type of walima they are having, you are allowed to excuse yourself, especially if you are talibul ilm, a student of knowledge, or you are a scholar. Because of the hadith, anybody who believes in Allah in the last day should not be at a gathering where alcohol is consumed. So if the walima has a lot of fawahish there, the walima has a lot, a lot of munkar, even though it is far for you to go to a walima, you have to excuse yourself. The next chapter is secret marriage. Is it halal for uh, for two Muslims to get married in secret behind the back of their parents? The scholars of Islam they debated this issue and they arrive at the conclusion that secret marriage is makru. Secret marriage is not haram, it is makru as long as you have a wali to give the girl away and two witnesses and you give the girl a mahar and there was a rida agreement nobody was forced to marry anybody then this marriage which is a secret marriage is not haram because the four conditions of the marriage were met so the four conditions of the marriage are as follows agreement that's the first condition agreement secondly the dowry to give to the girl third a wali to give her away and the fourth is two witnesses so because these four conditions are met if they did not announce their marriage they did not do anything haram the first condition two witnesses agreement the dowry and the wali two witnesses agreement the dowry the wali okay shukran yes these are the four conditions now as for the hadith that says beat the drums and announce the marriage this hadith is a da'if hadith where the Prophet said beat drums and announce the marriage openly this hadith is a da'if hadith also the great scholar of Islam Ahmad Shakir Ahmad Shakir of Egypt he had two wives and the first wife did not know about the second wife until after he died And no scholar past or present criticized Ahmed Shakir and claimed he did haram. So even though he had two wives. Okay, you finally found the hadith. Okay, it's not it's not lawful for a woman to observe voluntary fast without the permission of her husband when he's at home. And she should not allow anyone to enter his home without his permission. This is a crucial hadith. I would like you to put it in the, in the notes at the section where it is relevant when I was discussing the rights of the husband. And I told you that one of the rights of the husband is that the woman is not allowed to fast without his permission. And this is right number eight. So secret marriages are not haram, they are makru. So a person who done a secret marriage, you are not allowed to say that he is committing zina. And you are not allowed to say that he is living in sin. And you are not allowed to say that if a child is born from that marriage, which is a secret marriage, that child is a bastard child. That is going to the extreme because secret marriages are not haram. The next chapter, can a woman prefer her parents over her husband? It is not permissible for a woman to prefer her parents over her husband. 
if there are two conflicting commandments one is from the husband and one is from the parents she has to give preference to the commandment of her husband over her parents because of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ if it were halal for a human being to bow down to another I would have commanded the woman to bow down to their husbands can a woman choose her parents over her husband yes um, can a woman choose her parents over her husband what if there are two conflicting commandments one is from the husband and one is from the parents she has to give preference to the commandment of the husband because of the hadith if it were halal for a human being to bow down to another I would have commanded the women to bow down to their husbands because of the special right over them given to the husband by Allah the next chapter what are the characteristics of a good husband the characteristics of a good husband are the following 10 things he should be pious the, what are the characteristics of a good husband so whenever a sister is looking for a husband and all of you in the room who are single you are looking for a husband unless you are engaged you stop looking so many sisters ask me in PM what qualities I should look for in a husband I've been swamped with such a question in PM what should I look for when I want to find a husband so sisters who have swamped me with this question you don't need to ask me this question again here is the answer the first thing you should look for is a pious husband he should be God fearing and the second characteristic he should be pious God fearing the second characteristic he should have good aqidah because of the hadith whenever Allah wants good for you he gives you the correct understanding of the deen please bring me the hadith whenever Allah wants good for you he gives you the proper understanding of the deen The, the third characteristic of a good husband, uh, where is the hadith? Whenever Allah wants good for you, if Allah desires good for someone, He bestows on him understanding of the deen. Yes. So you are not allowed to marry a man with dodgy aqidah, with the wrong understanding of the deen, false ideas, erroneous ideas. It is haram to marry a Brailwi or a Shia or a Saudi Salafi. All th three people are the greatest enemies of Islam. The Saudi Salafi believes you can snitch on the Mujahideen and hand them over to the Kuffar and that to dismantle the Sharia is a minor Kufr. And there's a Kafir in the UK promoting this Aqidah by the name of Abu Khadija. The Shiites make takfir on the Sahabas, the Brilwis. They pray to the inhabitants of the graves. So you're not allowed to marry these people, the Saudi Salafi, the Shia, the Brilwis, the, the Gufi Sufi, the Qadiani because they have dodgy aqidah if you marry them you are living in sin because these people are outside the fold of Islam because all of them went against the ijma of the ummah the Shiites went against the ijma of the ummah claiming the Quran is corrupted when the ummah said it is protected the Saudi Salafis went against the ijma of the ummah claiming to dismantle Allah's Sharia is minor kufr even though Ibn Kathir and Ibn Tamiya said it is major kufr the Brailers went against the Ijma of the Ummah praying to the graves when the Ummah says you are only allowed to pray to Allah because we say You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. So all these all these retards went against the Ijma of the Ummah. The Qadianis went against the Ijma of the Ummah claiming that there is a prophet after Muhammad when there is no prophet after Muhammad So this the second thing you should look forward in a good husband is what Aqidah is he upon is he a follower of snake Nazim 
Is he a Saudi Salafi? Is he Burelu? Is he Goofy Sufi? Is he a Shia? What Aqidah is he upon? I was impressed. I was looking for a husband for a sister. This sister was only 18 years old. Only 18 years old. And the first question she asked me is, What Aqidah is he upon? The, the third quality is that the husband should be trustworthy. Your husband should not be a con artist. A con man. He cons everybody he sees. He even con his own wife. He should be trustworthy. Because the Rasul said what? La deen liman la amana lahu. Anybody with no amana, no trustworthiness, he has no deen. Uh, please bring me the hadith. I've quoted it in this room a million times. I'm sure you have it on file. La deen liman la amana lahu. Anyone with no deen, any man with no amana, he has no deen. So the other quality you should look forward to in your husband, he should be trustworthy. So I was swamped with, with, with this question from sisters. How can I find a husband? What should I look for? There is no faith for the one who has no trust. And there is no religion for the one that does not fulfill his promises. Yes. So the third characteristic you should look forward to is your husband should be trustworthy. And the the fourth characteristic, he should be strong spiritually and physically. Your husband should be strong spiritually and physically. Now the scholars who mention this as a characteristic, they bring a Quranic verse as the Hujjah. They quoted Surah 28 verse 26 in which when Musa ran away to Median and he was taken in by a family. The, the, the girl said to her father, what, listen to what the girl said to her father, Ya Abati, Ista Jirhu, Inna Khair Man, Ista Jarta, Al Qawi Al Amin. Oh my father, hire him. Hire him. Who is him? Who is him? Him means Musa. The word him here is Musa. She's talking about Musa. Hire him. Verily, the best of men for you to hire is the strong and the trustworthy. The scholar said the reason why the girl realized that Musa was trustworthy is because he lowered his gaze. When he was in their company, he lowered his gaze. And she was impressed with his taqwa. So, the other characteristic that you look forward in a man when you are looking for a husband, somebody who is physically strong and spiritually strong. So a man who is weak and impotent, uh, he is a hopeless case. Why do you want to marry a man who is weak and impotent? Only careful women do this because they are they're after the money. Kafir women, they do this. They are after the money. They don't care if the man is impotent as long as he has millions in the bank. She's going to have a lover behind his back anyway. She doesn't give a damn if he's impotent. He has money. I'm going to have a lover behind his back anyway. A Muslim woman cannot be like that. You can't have a lover behind the back of your husband. So whenever you want a husband, you should go for the one who is spiritually strong and physically strong. And Musa got married to one of the girls in in the in the the, the town of Median. The other characteristic of the husband is that he should be just. He should not be oppressive, and this is the fifth characteristic. 
he should be just and not oppressive because zulm was made haram the hadith ya ibadi inni haramtu zulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tadhalamu o my servants i have made zulm oppression haram on me allah and i've made it haram amongst you Therefore, do not oppress each other. Uh, please bring me the hadith. Ya ibadi inni haramtu dhulma. Ya ibadi inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama. Fala tadhalamu. Hadith 24 from the 40 hadith. Hadith 24 from the 40 hadith. Ya ibadi inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi. O my servants, I have made oppression haram on me Allah and I've made it haram I'm not oppress one another so if your husband is tyrannical he's going to oppress you and you're going to suffer a nervous breakdown so the good man is the one who is not oppressive the other characteristic of the good man he is mild tempered or where's the hadith is the 40 hadith hadith 24 from hadith Imam an nawawi ya ibadi inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altu humaynakum muharrama fala tadhalamu O my servants, I have made oppression haram on me, Allah, and I have made it haram amongst you. Therefore, do not oppress one another. Hadith 24 from the 40 hadith of Imam an nawawi Um, where is the hadith? You are taking too long to bring the hadith to the screen. I'm telling you where the hadith is found. You still can find it. Hadith 24 from Imam an nawis 40 hadith. O oh, my servants, I have made oppression haram upon myself and also between you. So do not oppress each other. Okay, shukran. Where is the takhrij? This hadith is Sahih Muslim. This hadith is found in Sahih Muslim. And please put it, the takhrij Sahih Muslim. Um, could you save this hadith because I've quoted it a million times in the room before. And keep it on your files. This hadith is found in Sahih Muslim. The next characteristic of a good husband, he is mild tempered. He is not quick to anger. And this is the sixth characteristic. And the evidence for this is Surah 3, 159, where Allah said, Fabima rahmatin min Allah, lint lahum. It was by the mercy of Allah, O Muhammad, that you were kind and gentle towards your companions. If you were harsh-hearted with them, they would have broken away from you. They would have stopped being your companions. So even though they disobeyed him at the battle of Uhud and caused them to lose the battle, still he was soft and tender when he was correcting his sahabas and by the mercy of Allah you dealt with them gently and had you been severe and harsh hearted they would have broken away from about you so this is the, uh, the evidence that a real husband a good husband he is soft hearted with his wife if you are harsh hearted you are going to end up in divorce you're going to live on your own, die on your own in old age. You're going to die in old age on your home. No woman in the world can stay with you because you are ill-tempered. You are hot-tempered. Now these men who are not soft and gentle, they kill women. Whenever a man is quick to anger, they kill women. When I was in Belmarsh prison in the UK, I saw a lot of men in prison who kill women. 
And the men who drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes, the nicotine destroys them psychologically. So they are hot tempered and they kill women. And whenever a man has a small genitalia, he kills women a lot too because he is insecure. And because of his small genitalia, he is insecure. He accuses the woman of cheating even when she is not cheating. And he is frustrated. These men, they are hot tempered and they kill women. The the seventh characteristic of a good husband is that he is ambitious. He he is going somewhere in life because one of the questions Allah asks you in the Quran, Surah eighty one, verse twenty six, for Aina Tadhabun, where are you going? This is one of the questions Allah asks you in the Quran. Where are you going? Surah 81 verse 26. فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ The other characteristic of a good husband is that he is wise. Because Prophet Lut said to the homosexuals who stormed his house, أَلَيْسَ مِنْكُمْ رَجْلُ رَشِيدٌ Surah 11 verse 78. Don't disgrace me in front of my guests. Isn't there a man from among you who is wise? So he, a, a wise man, he thinks with his akl, not with his private parts. A fool thinks with his private parts. The imbecile, the fool. The wise man thinks with his akl. So what did Prophet, what did Prophet Lut say to them? Alaysa minkum rajul rashid The Arabic word rashid means a wise person The ninth characteristic is that he is hard working Because Allah said in Surah 53 verse 39 Laysa illa ma sa'a Man will only accomplish that which he strives for Surah 53 verse 9 Sorry, Surah 53, verse 39. Surah 53, verse 39. Man accomplished that which he strives for. Also, you are not supposed to beg because those who beg will have no flesh on their face on the day of judgment. A real man is not a freeloader. A real, man, a real man doesn't live off his wife like a parasite, a freeloader. A freeloader is a man who lives off his wife like a parasite. He doesn't work, but he expects three meals a day. And he beats her if she doesn't cook three meals a day. These are the freeloaders. A real man is hardworking. He doesn't beg off others. Because the beggar will have no meat on his face on the day of judgment. The tenth characteristic of a good husband is that he is jealous over his wife because of the hadith where the Rasul said the man with no jealousy over his wife will never go to the paradise. The man with no jealousy over his wife will never go to the paradise. Uh, please bring me the hadith where the Prophet said three people will never go to the paradise. Three people will never go to the paradise. Uh, please bring me the hadith. And one of them is the man who has no jealousy over his wife. The one who disobeys his parents. Three people will not enter the paradise. Allah will not even look at them on judgment day. The one who is disobedient to his parents. The woman who imitates men. And the, the youth. The youth means the man with no jealousy over his wife. The eleventh characteristic of the husband that you are looking for is he should appear handsome in your eyes, in your psyche. He should appear to be handsome in your eyes. Somebody you can live with and you, he is pleasant, his face is pleasant. You don't find his face to be repellent. Because of the hadith in which Fatima bin Qais said, I don't blame 
I don't find any fault with my husband in regards to his deen or his character, but I hate kufr. And the Prophet said to the man, Akbil al hadika wa tatalikuha tatlika. Take back your garden and give her one divorce. This is called khula, a woman divorcing her husband because there was no chemistry in the marriage. So you are not allowed to accept the proposal of a brother until you are absolutely sure about the chemistry. Sister of Abdullah bin Ubay came to the Prophet I have, I have nothing against Thabit ibn Qais as regards his religion or his behavior, but I hate to commit any act of kufr when I am a Muslim. The Prophet said, will you give him his garden back will you give his garden back to him Bahar, being a garden she said yes so the messenger of Allah sent word to him take back your garden and give her one pronouncement of divorce ok shukran for the takhreej fatul bari kitab talaq bab khula khula means a woman divorcing her husband because there is no chemistry but if she is divorcing her husband because he beats her up she doesn't use khula she used a different system which is called Fasqh. And Fasqh is annulment. If you are divorcing your husband because he's evil in character, you don't use Khula, you use Fasqh. Khula is when you are divorcing him because there is no chemistry. It was an infatuation. But Fasqh is when you divorce him because of his evil character. With Fasqh, you keep the dowry. With khula, you have to return the dowry, and that's the difference in the two divorces. So, the man that you are getting married to should at least appear handsome in front of your eyes, so that you don't have a problem to consummate. Because this sahabiya said, when he comes to have sex with me, I feel like spitting in his face, because there was no chemistry. For her to go to bed with him was difficult, it was laborious. Difficult and laborious. Because there was no chemistry. The next chapter, what are the characteristics of a good wife? I've given you the characteristics of the good husband. The next chapter, what are the characteristics of a good wife? The first characteristic of a good wife is that she is pious, just like the man, she should be pious. And the evidence is that the Prophet said, Tunka al Mar Ali Arba. Men normally marry women for four reasons. Limaliha wali Jamaliha wali Nasabiha wali Diniha Fafar Bedata Deen Tarbat Yadak for her beauty, her nobility, her wealth and her piety the Prophet said go for the woman with piety she will help you to enter the paradise so this is the hujja used by the scholars to say that the very first characteristic of a good woman is piety and when you pray you say Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab nar oh Allah give us the good of the dunya and give us the good of the hereafter and save us from the hellfire. The good of the dunya are four things. A pious wife, a spacious home, a reliable transportation and a good neighbor. So this is another hujja used by the scholars to say that you should go for piety. The second characteristic of the woman, the good woman is obedience. She should be obedient. Um, where is the hadith? The Prophet said the hasana of the dunya are four things. A righteous wife, a reliable transportation, a spacious home, and a good neighbor. Uh, the second characteristic of a good wife, she should be obedient. 
The Prophet said, four things bring one joy, a righteous wife, a spacious house, a pious neighbor, and a comfortable riding animal. Reported by Al-Hakim and, and Abu Naim and Bayhaqi. Okay, shukran. Please save these hadiths, all these hujjah, this, the topic today has a lot of hujjah. Even though I bring evidence for everything I preach, people still have a problem with the message. Subhanallah. Everything I preach, I bring evidence. Still, I have enemies. They can't accept what I'm saying. And I'm not giving my own opinion. Subhanallah. The problem is not the hujjah. The problem is your heart. You have the disease of hypocrisy in your heart. That's why you can't accept the hujjah. Some people have stomach ulcer. They can't eat some food. There is no problem with the food. Your stomach is bad. You have stomach ulcer. The food is good, but you can't eat certain food because of your bad stomach. Stomach ulcer. There is nothing wrong with the hujja I'm bringing here. Quran, Sunnah. Quran, Sunnah. The problem is your heart. You have the disease of hypocrisy in your heart. Those who can't accept the hujja. The other characteristic of the good wife, she protects her private parts behind the back of her husband oh. Alhamdulillah yes I was taught Sorry. yes I was taught in the university I studied to bring takhrij to bring evidence you can't write a thesis without evidence Okay, who protects his tongue and his private parts from illegal intercourse, I shall guarantee him in the paradise. Yes. So the other characteristic of the good wife, the pious wife, the wife with the woman with good characteristic marriage material is she protects her private parts behind the back of her husband. And when she goes to a home, she doesn't uncover her hair. She doesn't take off her she doesn't take off her hijab and expose her hair to non mahram. Some women they do that. In front of the husband, they wear hijab. Behind his back, they take off their hijab and expose their hair to non mahram. This is not a good woman. She's not marriage, marriage material. The fourth characteristic, she should be childbearing. The woman should be of childbearing age. Because of the hadith, Tazawwaju al Wadud al Walud, Fa inni mukathir bikum al umam yum al kiyama. Mother, women who are loving and affectionate, women who are, who can give birth to kids, because it is by these women I will compete with the other prophets to have the most followers on the day of judgment. So the characteristic you look forward to in a woman is that she should be of childbearing age. Uh, where is the hadith? Marry women who are prolific, who can give birth to kids because it is by these women. And this hadith is found in Musnad Ahmed. I found it in Abu Dawood. I did not know it was in Ahmed. I know it to be in Abu Dawood. Marry the childbearing love women for I shall outnumber the peoples by you on the day of resurrection. Okay, shukran for the hadith. The fifth characteristic of a good wife is that she is romantic and affectionate. So a woman, a woman who is not romantic and not affectionate, she has no emotions, she's like a piece of stone, that is not a good wife. A good wife is romantic and affectionate. And because of that, the Prophet said, Mari al-Wadud. The Arabic word al-Wadud means the women who are romantic and affectionate. Al-Walud. Al-Walud means those who can give birth to Walad. Walad means a boy or a girl. In this case, it means Walad, a boy or a girl. Al-Wadud, the loving and affectionate woman. The sixth characteristic, she, she should be a woman. When you look at her, she pleases you. 
she should be beautiful in your eyes the sixth characteristic is that she should be beautiful in your eyes because the purpose of your marriage is for you to lower your gaze the purpose of the marriage is for you to lower your gaze so if your wife is not beautiful in your eyes you're going to look at other women the evidence that the wife should be a woman who appears beautiful in your eyes Surah Nisa verse 3 Fankihu ma taba lakum min nisa Marry women who are pleasing to you the, the Arabic word taba from the word tayyib women who are pleasing to you those women who tickle your fancy Fankihu ma taba lakum min nisa mathna wa thalatha wa ruba the hadith of Ahmed ibn Hanbal go and look at her the woman you are considering to marry because this will help your time together to be strengthened yes the seventh characteristic she should be mild tempered and the eighth characteristic she should be wise there's a hadith that says stay away from foolish women because they will transfer the foolishness to your kids she should not be imbecile or retard she should be a wise woman not someone who is imbecile or retarded stay away from these women who are retards because the kids will become a retard just like them the apple didn't fall far from the tree the ninth characteristic she should be loyal to her husband she has loyalty loyalty should be a trait in her the tenth characteristic she should dress up for her husband so when Abu when Salman al Farisi went to visit Abu Darda his wife was not dressing up and she, he asked her why she dressed like that she said your brother doesn't want anything to do with the dunya he's fasting every day and every night he prays tahajjud in other words he doesn't go to bed with me my sexual needs are not being met and then Salman al Farisi reminded him your body has a right over you your wife has a right over you your lord has a right over you so this Sahaba was so pious he was neglecting the sexual needs of his wife and she stopped dressing up for him why is it that uh, Salman al-Farisi was surprised when she did not dress up for her husband because it is the norm for a woman to dress up for her husband and if he doesn't something is wrong with that woman then Salman said it is true that you owe your duty to your Lord but you also owe a duty to yourself and to your wife so you should carry out your duty to everyone then they went to the Prophet and related all that transpired he said Salman was right the Prophet said what Salman was right you are not supposed to be so pious you ignore the sexual needs of your wife yes this is the hadith I wanted this is the perfect hadith for the topic so a woman should dress up she should make an effort and dress up for her husband by wearing things like lingerie negligee stockings tights and so on and so forth in the bedroom the next chapter a stingy husband um, the, the person taking notes the next chapter is the stingy husband the stingy husband the scholars of Islam agree unanimously among themselves that it is permissible for a woman 
to take from the wealth of a stingy husband without his permission for running the household for what she needs to run the household to run the house because when Hind bint Utba took Shahada she gave her bay'ah to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet told her don't commit zina and don't steal she said my husband Abu Sufyan is he's stingy can I take from his wealth the Prophet said to Hind bint Utba take from his wealth what you need to run the household so the Prophet gave her permission to take from him what is necessary to run the household um, I'm not ready for that hadith as yet please don't bring that hadith as yet So the stingy husband, the wife is allowed to spend from his wealth without his permission as long as she uses her discretion. The next, can a woman spend from her own money without the permission of her husband? The answer yes, it is permissible for a woman to spend from her own money without the permission of her husband if she is mature and she is not retarded so a woman who is mature wise and not a retard she is allowed to spend from her own money without the permission of her husband the next question can a woman give away in charity from her husband wealth without his permission listen to the question can a woman give away in charity from her husband's wealth without his permission the answer is yes she can give in charity from her husband's wealth without his permission and the Prophet said if you do that the husband will get half of the baraka. so you can bring the hadith where the Prophet said any woman who gives from her husband's wealth without his permission she gets half he the husband gets half the barakah half the reward she should not fast at times other than Ramadan except with the permission that she should um, if a wife gives her husband property something in charity without his permission he will get half the reward yes Bukhari volume 7 and the number is 273 yes so if a woman spends from her husband wealth to give in charity without his permission she will get half the reward and um, please save this hadith found brought by authentic toy 19 for the files can a woman open the door to her brother-in-law with can uh, if a woman is at home by herself can she open the door to her brother-in-law the brother of her husband the answer is no it is haram and the Prophet said the brother-in-law is death this hadith is found in Bukhara the Prophet said what the brother-in-law is death meaning it's easy for her to commit zina with her brother-in-law this is the meaning of the hadith the brother-in-law is death and this hadith is in Bukhari so it is haram for a woman who is by herself at home to open the door to her brother-in-law the brother-in-law means the brother of her husband because the hadith says the brother-in-law is death okay shukran this is the end of our topic the rules of marriage I'll pause I'll take five questions only five questions we will not come back to this topic maybe until after one year because I don't like to repeat topics we have many topics to cover so this brings us to the end of the rules of marriage
what if the woman wants to marry a man with this Muslim characteristics and the father don't allow must she obey if the man has these characteristics that means your father is being unreasonable so you can go ahead with the marriage but you have to appoint your own wali you cannot marry without a wali you have to appoint a wali to give you away on the wedding day why you can appoint a wali and go ahead because your father is being unreasonable if the man has all these characteristics and you your father disagrees you must appoint your own wali yes you you have to appoint your own wali and go ahead with the marriage because your father is being awkward and unreasonable being awkward and unreasonable uh, next question please If your father is Barelwi or Shia, if your father has Daji Akira, you don't need his permission. You only need his permission when he's Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. I read a photo from Ibn Baz saying if a woman menstruation stops in the time of Asr she should make up Dhuhr also and if she gets off her menstruation her menses at the time of Isha she should make up Maghrib is this correct because Aisha said they didn't make up Salah for menses um, this photo is a bit weird and it doesn't comply with the hadith of the Rasul Sallallahu um, this fatwa is weird and it doesn't coincide with the hadith of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam What was the hadith about the man who is married to a disobedient wife? Does it affect his salah? If you have a disobedient wife and did not divorce her, your salah is not accepted. You have to div divorce your wife if she is disobedient. Um, shukran for bouncing the person with that nick. Um, I was wondering why the admins took so long to bounce this person I don't want admins to be sleeping in my dars We have to give um, we have to give 
a name for this dars, it cannot be it, it, the, the rights of the wife and the rights of the husband, that is today's, today's dars. The, the dars was bedroom etiquette, the one before this. Tonight's dars, the rights of the wife and the rights of the husband. We cannot call everything the rules of nikah. You have to split up the, the dars and give it different names. I live in a Bengali community in UK and the brothers go back home and marry women who come to the UK and spend all their money on their family in Bangladesh. And the husband starts to forget his own family and starts to be rude to his mother. Many of the brothers change so much as much as the day is compared to the night. Could it be that the brothers are on the spells? That is a possibility that we can't rule out. They could be on the spells. And some people are afraid to marry to people back home because when a woman comes to the UK from Bangladesh, from India, from Pakistan, the family expect them to feed them. You have to feed a whole family back home. If you don't want the fitna of having to feed a whole family back home, then marry a UK girl. You don't have that fitna. If you don't want the fitna of having to feed a whole family back home in Bangladesh or Pakistan or India, then marry a UK girl and don't marry from back home. Because if you marry from back home, you have to feed a whole family back home. And this can be frustrating. That's my advice to you. If you cannot afford to feed a whole family back home, marry a British girl, a UK girl. Then you won't have the fitna of having to feed a whole family. Can a woman choose anyone to be her wali? The wali has to be pious and knowledgeable. The wali cannot be just about anyone. He has to be pious and knowledgeable and knows about the rules of nikah. If he doesn't know the rules of nikah, then he's not suitable to be a wali. A woman choose a wali if the wali is awkward. If her wali is awkward, she has her sexual needs to fulfill and he's blocking the marriage, he keeps blocking the marriage, then she has to appoint her own wali. The brother has to be God-fearing and knowledgeable and knows about the rules of nikah. Is it permissible for Muslims to use marriage sites or is it haram person? Also, Sheikh, you said you shouldn't marry a brother unless you know you have good chemistry. Is it halal to do that over the phone and online? or only in person. You can find a person to marry online that is halal, but you are not allowed to marry the person until you vet the person in real life. You, have to, you can find a person online, but you have to have interviews with the person in the flesh to be sure about the chemistry. Online is not enough. You can find a car online to buy, but you are not allowed to buy the car till you test drive the car. What if it's not a proper car? There are people online are very, very dodgy. Don't you know that? A sister on Facebook has 11 fiancés. One sister has 11 fiancés and she fake her own death to get out of it. She had 11 fiancés, a woman, 11 fiancés on Facebook. She had to fake her own death to get away from it. So people online are very, very dodgy. They can be dodgy. So when you meet a person online, you are not allowed to marry the person until you vet the person in, in the flesh. Vet means to inspect. The word vet means to inspect the person thoroughly and scrupulously. When the person is vetted and you are satisfied, then you marry the person. That was the last question, I think. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashallallahu ilaha 
That is the last segment for our talk. The, the topic, the rules of nikah. Today, topic was the rights of the wife and the rights of the husband. The rights of the wife and the rights of the husband. I hope to go to another topic tomorrow. This topic won't be repeated and maybe until after one year if Allah wants me to live until one year. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashallah. Before I close with the dua. Uh, before I close with the door, I'd like to thank Mujahida101 for the notes, AT18 for the Quranic Hujjah, uh, AT19, Maki Finger, AT21 for the Hadith Hujjah, I'd like to thank AT16 and 12 for the question and answer session. Now that you you know about marriage, I even taught you how to make love properly in the bedroom. You shouldn't have any problems now. You can have the confidence to go and get married because you attended a thorough workshop. You attended a thorough, a complete workshop about marriage and everything about marriage in details. So you should now have the confidence to go and get married. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashallah ilaha. Il est en train de se faire